Um, welcome, everybody, to the uh, July meeting of the um, Early Television Muse Museum community. Um, got a good program tonight. Um, let's start with um, Dave's um, usual courtesy announcement. Yeah, I'll just remind everybody to please keep your microphones muted unless you're actively uh, involved in asking a question. And um, I think our uh, presenters tonight are aggressively uh, uh, inviting questions, but uh, please keep your microphone off at, at all other times, and that'll help us keep the chaos to a minimum. Thanks. Thanks, Dave. Um, I want to thank the uh, New Jersey Antique Radio Club for providing, uh, sponsoring this meeting and providing our, uh, our Zoom feed. Um, we really appreciate it. Give you a quick report on the museum. Um, we have 172 total members now, of which 141 are annual members, 25 are sustaining members, uh, and that's a growing number, by the way, and we have eight lifetime members, people who have made substantial donations to the museum. Um, our sweepstakes, as most of you know, are ongoing. They started uh, a little while ago. Um, the grand prize is a... Um, RCA TRK5. Um, it's, the cabinet has been restored and the electronics are all original and just ready for somebody to restore. That's pretty easy to set to restore. Fortunately, the picture tube is a 5BP4, which is easy to find. Though it comes, the set in the uh, sweepstakes comes with a, um, with a good one. Um, we need to sell $8,000 um, worth of tickets in order to uh, award the prize, we're at about 4,900 right now. I'm confident we'll reach that number because it's quite a ways till the uh, till the drawing. Drawing is going to be October 14th at our fall uh, swap meet. Um, a little warning: I'll keep reminding people that the, the, the rules have changed, and you can we can no longer sell tickets right up to the date of the drawing. So. Ticket sales will stop a week before the actual drawing. So we'll remind everybody of, uh, of that. So if you haven't bought tickets, buy them now. It's right, there's a link right on the homepage of our, um, of, um, of our website. Um, any questions about what's going on with the museum? Steve. Yeah. We did actually had someone who came in today. They were from out of town, and they actually joined. So you can actually add one more number to that membership. Good. Glad to hear it. I'll be sending you the information tomorrow. Thank you. Um, oh, I should want to mention one more thing. Some of you may have seen this, but I was interviewed by a um, uh, Associated Press writer, um, few weeks ago, and he wrote a nice story about the museum. It got published all over the country. Um, we've gotten copies of the of the article from paper, various papers, including the Washington Post and, and a bunch of smaller papers. Um, and since that time, we've had a, quite a bit of an increase in activity at the museum with people calling us and, and um, uh, attendance is up and so forth. So that's a great, a great bit of publicity. All right, well, let's move on to the um, our featured item tonight, um, and which is the um, the Dumont um, 180 pre-war set. Um, if you could um, hook Larry in, Dave. Here we go. This is a set we have on display at the museum out of its cabinet. Um, and we've done this to show you what a um, monstrosity it is. This set was introduced in 1938. Um, it uh, apparently uh, Dumont went to England in 1936 and uh, brought back with him a uh, Cosser set that was introduced in 1936. We have one, and 137T is the model, and the sets are very similar. Um, so I think Dumont just uh, just copied a lot of the circuits. The, um, the 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 180, which is the model we have, and the 183 are 14 inch 
uh, screens. Now, this is a big screen for a, uh, there's the 183 is the console model. Um, uh, 14 inches of big, um, uh, big screen size for a pre-war set. They actually made another set, the model 195, um, that has a 20 inch tube. Um, and I don't know if any of those sets survive, but the, the 20 inch, um, um, the 20 inch version, um, used the same technology as the, um, as the 14 inch. The interesting thing about the about the CRT here, other than its size, is that it's um, electrostatic deflection. Uh, if you look at the neck of it, you can see. I think Larry can show you. You can see the deflection plates, some of them uh, in there. Now, one of the problems with um, electrostatic deflection on a tube this size is that um, the anode voltage on the tube is is um, 8,000 volts. I'll talk a little bit more about that a little later. Uh, and so in order to deflect the beam, you needed a, um, a very, very high voltage swing. Um, and that was pretty hard to accomplish. The, the, I think the sawtooth wave on the deflection plates is almost 2,000 volts peak to peak in the horizontal and vertical um, directions. That's some of the, um, and, but he, they managed to get it to work. Um, an interesting thing about this tube, another interesting thing, is that it um, they had two versions of the set. The earlier ones were just like were the Model 180 and 183. Uh, later, probably in 1940, um, they introduced the, the X versions. Um, and th the sets are pretty well identical, except that um, the... They generated both 8,000 volts positive and 8,000 volts negative. And so they were able to supply the, essentially um, have the CRT with an effective voltage of 16,000 volts uh, on the CRT, CRT, which provided a pretty bright picture. And this set worked. We rebuilt it. And um, last year or so, it, uh, it uh, died. But it, provide, it, it really has a nice, bright picture. Um, uh, very, very surprisingly. Um, any questions about about this set? What frequency band did it operate in? This was a um, um, opera. Well, essentially, I think the tuner it had a, I believe, a three-channel tuner. Uh, so it's a, it was a super heterodyne design, uh, which is different from the Cosser they copied. Uh, it had uh, only the, the Cosser set only had one channel um, because Britain only had one channel, and it was about about 45 megahertz was the video carrier. Here, it, the, the tuner in this set works from about 40 40 to 80 megahertz, and you could tune it to any you know any six megahertz channel you wanted in that in that in that area. I have a question. Any, any uh, idea of how many were built? I have a question, please. Go ahead. Uh, did, did it use AM modulation for the audio? Yes. Um, all of the pre-war sets, um, American sets, originally had AM uh, audio. Okay. So this thing, does it w work now? Well, it did uh, up until last year when something died in it. But um, to anticipate your question, it is um, you can use a set with AM sound uh, uh, with F, with a, with the um, um, that is designed for AM sound with with an FM signal source uh, using slope detection. And you essentially, you just slightly detune the Frequency of the um, uh, of the of the uh, audio uh, channel and the slope of that because you're not right on center of the frequency the slope of the uh, response provides um, uh, demodu demodulation and so the sound sound you can use this set even you know on NTSC signals. Did it 
these uh, sets use a post-deflection acceleration? I see a, a side connection there to the uh, CRT. Yeah. So they get pretty good brightness. It was pretty good, yes. Yeah. Hey, Steve. I assume it wasn't 525 lines. Uh, what was it, 430 or something like that? Well, again, mm -hmm. no, it was 4, I can't remember, 441, I think, something like that. They changed it all over the place during that time period. They ended up mm -hmm. on 525. But again, um, you know, the, the the horizontal and vertical, the vertical frequencies are, are the same, 60 hertz. And the horizontal scan frequencies uh, with, for, for 525 is about 15 kilohertz. And for... Uh, what they use is about 11 kilohertz, and the the horizontal controls on all these free war sets uh, will operate fine at um, you know uh, at uh, the, you can just turn them right up to, to work at uh, with the NTSC signals. Who provided the NTSC signals for for reception for this set? Yeah. Hey Steve. Yeah. I think I've got a. You look here, I've got that tube, I think. It has that what I call an English socket in it. This looks like it, and it's got that anode post on the side of it. You know, I couldn't hear you. Could you uh, oh. try I'm again? Sorry. I think I've got one of those uh, CRTs for that set. Oh, good. They are. Um, Can you see it? anybody seen the picture um are you sure are you showing it now i am uh, see it. i've got a problem here i've got two uh i'm up on there twice i was yeah. thought i was having trouble with my computer and i don't know how to get rid of this other one and uh let me try this I kicked you out, Julian, one of you. You're muted, Julian. <laughs> you, oh, can you hear me now? I can see you in a little small. Um, I can't see if I can't see you. Your yeah. picture is on the screen, but just a, just a thumbnail. Oh, yeah, that looks well. Check. Wait a minute, that that could be it. It's hard to tell. Does it have a number on it? Uh, no, I did understand that it was a hand built tube from uh, pre war, and it has what I call an English socket on the back that huge socket on it. But you can see the anode stud there on it, maybe. Could looks be. to be like a fourteen inch or something like that. I have to probably, measure. It's probably the probably the same tube. They made um, actually made a post war version of that tube, um, which is which is as far, as far as I can tell, pretty much identical. Just has a different part number. Hmm. This one, uh, yeah, it, it's got a huge neck on the back of it, right, and. Um, it's electrostatic, of course. I imagine it would be. I don't think this one was ever used, but I'm not right. sure about that. But And I've got another one that's identical to this one, except it has a doesn't have that English socket on the back. It looks like a like a 21 inch round color tube would have on the back of it. Hmm. And it does have a number on it. Let me go dig it up and see what it says. Yeah. I have a well, question. Go ahead. Yeah. So the set is shown, even though inoperable, you mentioned it was compatible or would be compatible with NTSC broadcasts. So if you had the right converter from current digital to NTSC, would that set actually receive real and decipherable TV broadcasts? Yes. Several of our pre-war sets 
do work, and <laughs> they do display. They work from NTSC, and they display you know good pictures. Wow! Thank you. So you could watch Howdy Doody on that rerun. <laughs> you, you could. You could. Okay. Right. Thanks. Bye. Question. Hey, Steve. Yes. Uh, as luck would have it, uh, I have I have the console version, and um, it had a bad CRT in it, and uh, you could tell something was on, but it was very dim. And then a few years ago, uh, Harry Poster had a, a an article or an ad on in eBay that he had a bunch of surplus stuff from a deceased uh, Dumont engineer, and one of the tubes looked like it could be that tube, and I. I bought it. It had a lot of things this guy was working on, including helium neon laser tubes, and oh. uh, took a chance and put it in the set. I could see visually that all the pins seemed to be the same. And sure enough, I have a very nice, bright picture with a CRT that uh, probably only has a few hours on it now. You're, you're very lucky. Yep. Steve, I've got this other tube here. It... Um... It has a, a joint Army Navy uh, number on it. It's got a socket on it, like an old round tube color set, and it's a twelve GP seven. That yeah, would be some a, kind of a radar. The P seven. It's a radar tube. It's a radar yeah. tube. As you probably know, Dumont uh, made all, manufactured all kinds of CRTs um, before, during, and after the war. So I suspect they made. Um, uh, you know, they made that for the military. Yeah, this one's the military version of it with a P7 phosphor in it. Right. Right. If I may again. Yes. Okay. Um, so we've established that set, if running, would be able to receive TV broadcast. NTSC is fine. But my question would be the phosphor in that picture tube, C or T, whatever, would that actually look like? Uh, a TV that was made in like 1953 in terms of the black and white that it showed. Or Very simple. Greenish or what? It was a little, no, it was a little bit, we, we have a comparison because yeah. our, our um, one of our sets that yeah. works has yeah. a, um, has the original 12 AP4 yeah. tube in it. And we also had we had a bunch of, of uh, British radar tubes rebuilt years ago to make replicas to replace them, and we have we have had both tubes, both the original yeah. tubes and the replica in the in that set. And there is a little difference. I would say that the 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 pre war tubes are a little bit muddier looking than than modern, but but awfully similar. When you say muddy, do you mean in terms of the black color? The, the contrast isn't as... Is contrast, as yeah. Okay. Okay, thank you. Bye. Mm -hmm. yeah, it's a question. Do you have any audio on me? Yes. Excuse me? There we can hear you. Yeah. Uh, yeah, earlier, uh, I think you showed uh, on the, a placard on the wall indicating it was a 14-inch uh, set. But I, I believe when you zoomed the camera in on um, kind of an aged, you know, probably thermally discolored label uh, on the neck of the tube, I could swear it said 12-inch. So, again, just to be sure, clear, what size... Uh, what is this Dumont set? It's a 14 inch. And the tube is a 14 AP4. Excellent. Thank you very much. Okay. I'm going to pipe up again. Um, when, when the NTSC thing was what, 525 or whatever lines, okay? And so. This set being pre-war, if you did watch a modern broadcast through the converter or original NTSC, did it have 525 lines or did it somehow compromise resolution to accommodate the set's native resolution? No, it, it had, it had um, um, 
it had the the the, the band pass of the IF in the pre-war sets was pretty similar to what was after the war. Okay. And so it displayed 525 lines with about the same resolution as a as a uh, early post-war set. Wow. It just muddied it a little bit, apparently. So, so, yeah, right. But the picture is awfully good on, on the, well, yes. some of those pre-war sets. Wow. Did it use a sawtooth for the whatever direction? Uh, yes. It did. Okay, thank you. Steve, I've also got two more of these uh, smaller tubes that have this English socket on the back. Looks like about a three-inch screen on the front. And both of them have a tag on it. It just says uh, type VCR 138A, British from A&M Stocks or something. And it's dated April 23rd of 1947. And um, looks like it's about 15 inches or so long. Does anybody know what this might have been used in? Well, I, it wasn't used in any of the British pre-war sets. Uh, I can tell you that because they didn't. The, they, they were some five-inch sets, but no three-inch ones. Well, this one could be. Let's see, one, two, three. Well, it looks like a three, three and a half inch or something, and it's about fifteen inches long. Right. Typically, the three-inch tubes are used on oscilloscopes. Okay, even with that big English socket on the back. That I don't know. It's got the same socket that that pre-war set has on it. It's, it's definitely English. Hmm. Not sure where I got these, but they may have been a military tube of some for, 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 you know. You never know. Probably was. Yeah. Any other questions? Well, before we turn this over to our presenters, um, I'm wondering if there are any newcomers to this meeting that would like to introduce themselves and uh, tell us a little bit about yourselves. I don't know if I'm a newcomer. I could be an old comer at my age. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> Sorry. Well, okay. Um, I worked as a research engineer for many years until I became an artifact of retirement. I'm fascinated by early broadcasting in all forms, both you know detection coherers and all that in the AM radio sense, the development of FM. But as I almost grew up, I like to think, um, I watched a 1953 Emerson, I think it was. And so I'm very curious about how the electronics and so on worked in early television. That was really a nascent revolution that was going to come post-war. So here I am, you know, I mean, I didn't, I, I did digital circuitry professionally. And so I, I'm not an analog person. My wife might call me that, but I'm not. And, and so I'm very curious how this early stuff developed. That museum somehow fascinates me. I mean, you guys really know what you're doing. And I even had, what was it, a CT100 um, color TV in high school. It burned out and it got dumped. But that color was incredible. So, for example, the phosphor apparently in that picture tube in that thing, were, phosphors were very accurate. And so I was at some engineering conference and there was a... Um, a display conference concurrently, and some guy actually had a well-converged uh, CT100 and compared that to a modern display, and the color was just incredible. And so that sort of fascinates me how accurately early electronics actually worked, even though with 30 tubes, it didn't last long. So that is, what can I say? Bye. Thank you. Welcome. Glad to, glad to have you here. Anyone else? Well, I guess not. I guess we're all yeah. old timers. Excuse me. Did I hear somebody? Steve, I've raised my hand. I'm not sure if you see that. Oh, <laughs> now I see it. Yep. Right. Because I use the Zoom a lot. You know, this is sort of the habit I get into. Um, 
permission to introduce myself. Go right ahead. So I'm the guy with a cap. And um, I'm the new member that Larry uh, mentioned, your uh, uh, person that was at the, uh, the museum today. So um, I came in with uh, another colleague, and actually my sweetheart. We both teach um, at this point in our lives. I, I, um, I teach um, as a result of retiring. <laughs> I, I worked in the automobile industry for uh, for a long time, and then when I took retirement, the colleges love people like me, so they hired me to teach tech. So I'm a tech teacher. I um, from I'm from the Detroit area, and uh, I was absolutely. She, uh, my partner, suggested, "Hey, let's go to that uh, early television museum." And I'm like, "Okay," <laughs> not really expecting much. But why we wound up spending like pretty much four hours. This is marvelous. I can't even begin to communicate to you um, how marvelous it is because a lot of the years now that I've been at the college teaching electronics and communication arts, um, I've, I call it the flat earth, which is the book has a picture of what you all have physically in this museum. And um, when I was trying to um, teach uh display technology and all that kind of stuff. And so to see it in the, in the flesh, to actually see these properties was just rewarding as heck. I'm now going to, when I go back, I'm going to see if I can write a grant, see if I can get a school bus and drag everybody down from Detroit to go see your museum. Cause it's, it's, um, it's, it's incredible to have that much artifact in one place is just, uh, um, I, I can't, I can only commend you all. And um, so that's why I wanted to join and probably participate in some other ways as well. So that's it. That's all I'll say for now. All right. Well, thank you very much. I'm glad you enjoyed it. Anybody else want to introduce themselves? Well, I hear silence. So let's move on to our presentation. Um, George Lamaster and John Turner are going to talk about um, uh, quad videotape recording, um, and this should be fascinating. So let me uh, let me turn it over to them. My name is George Lamaster. I um, got into television working at a summer job at a TV station for vacation relief. And that led to one thing and another of working in broadcasting for several years. Um, I did work on these two inch quad tape machines for quite a few years and uh, uh, don't claim to be an expert on them, but uh, Dave wanted to discuss them. So I, I did a presentation here and I hope it'll be interesting. What I'd like to do is make it a very informal presentation and if you have any question please don't hesitate to jump in and ask and I'll, I'll do my very best to address it uh, John Turner will show you later some uh, uh, very you know real machines in operation at his facility that I think would be just fantastic what I'd like to do is um, go through kind of the, the history of how videotape recording came to be and what evolved into what we knew as quad quad meaning it's just a recorder that used four heads on a wheel and uh, uh as opposed to longitudinal recording like an audio tape recorder or something like that and so i'll try to go through that and again uh please don't hesitate to jump in and ask questions i don't claim to be the world expert i just uh, uh put down some things and i hope i can touch on a couple of areas of uh, how they record this on the tape, what some of the issues were, who the big players were, and how they got color to work on these machines, which was a pretty interesting history. Okay, here we go. Um, the first thing on trying to record video, uh, you, you got to have a very narrow head gap. You know, as you know, with audio recording, you can run the head gap narrow and you can run the tape faster and get wider bandwidth on the recording. So there were some recording efforts before 
uh, what we call quad tape. Uh, people were really would like to do this. One of the people that really wanted it was Bing Crosby, and he had a company called Bing Crosby Enterprises, and a man named Jack Mullen, who had been really uh, a big figure in audio recording, uh, was put on the job to try to come up with a video recorder for the audio uh, recorder he had built for for uh, Crosby originally. And so he had some success. He used a multi-track head stacked vertically, ran the tape at 120 inches per second, um, did kind of a time sample. So he was effectively scanning the tape, but with a fixed head stack instead of a rotary head. And he did get it to work. But then in 1955, uh, Ampex invited him up to take a look at what they had done. He came back to his company and sold it because he said they win. Um, they, they understand how to do it. Um, where we don't have it. So he sold his company to 3M and then, then worked for 3M till his retirements. In England in the early 50s, the BBC had a longitudinal machine for 405 line called the Vera machine. Uh, it was uh, band split. They had a high frequency and low frequency track plus sound. It ran at 200 inches per second. RCA was working on it as well. And they demonstrated in 53, they had a, a multi-track machine that record red, blue, green, uh, mixed highs, audio, control track, a bunch of things on a tape going at 360 inches per second. And it did work, but it was a little impractical because of the tape speed. And I'll bring up another person that was important in recording history. And that was Marvin Camrus at Armor Research in Chicago. I, I know he worked on wideband tape. I don't see any evidence that he really worked on the quad uh, machine, but he is an important person uh, in the world of recording. So in the upper left, there's the Vera machine in England. And the right is um, RCA with Sarnoff holding up the tape. Lower left is Marvin uh, in Chicago. And lower right is Jack Mullen there on the left in the white shirt. And you recognize Bing Crosby. So Ampex was working on this, and they had been working on FM to try to make a wideband instrumentation recorders for military and things like that. And they had been studying FM recording on tape. And so that turned out to be the really big breakthrough to put video onto tape. So they record FM RF onto the tape, not audio like you think of in an audio recorder. And the second problem they had to solve was that head to tape speed. So they wound up using a, a rotary head. They really were um, innovative in coming up with that. It also depended on having a really good tape that 3M came up with. And Bobby Ellerby has a really good uh, account of that whole thing on his website, if you want to look there. And he has uh, links to a lot of things that have tremendous in-depth history that we won't go into tonight. But in any event, Ampex demonstrated that tape machine at 1956 at NAB. This was the team that developed it. Um, I think most of these people are no longer with us, but um, uh, that was an amazing, amazing project. That they uh, came up with this machine and it got really good results out of it with their innovative work. This was the production model of the VR-1000 that they were selling in 1957. Um, it's got two racks of tubes. You can see to the left, that's where the servos and the RF electronics are in. There's more electronics down in the base of the cabinet. Um, you'll see an oscilloscope on the left-hand control panel, and then there's a tectronic scope up in the top for looking at the video waveform. So that was a production machine. They, I don't know how many they sold, but a, a, quite a number of them. And they were taking orders as fast and building them as fast as they could after they showed it at NAB. So this recording head assembly had four heads that were mounted 90 degrees apart. The motor was locked with TV sync. It ran around. Uh, they ran ball bearings, and later they went to air bearings on the heads. Uh, the tape is pulled through at 15 inches per second, so a big reel of tape will run an hour, no problem. Um, the thing they really won on was getting the video tape to tape to video head to tape speed up when they got 1,560 inches per second by spinning the tape vertically against the head, uh, against the tape. And they were using a very narrow gap of about uh, five to 10 thousandths of an inch, uh, point of, um, five to point one uh, thousandths of an inch, very, very narrow gap. And it was a, quite a challenge to do that. They had to be very innovative on coming up with head materials that would withstand the pressure, the speed, the centrifugal force, and had the uh, magnetic characteristics and the RF characteristics to uh, lay that RF on the tape.
So the heads passed RF up to about seven megahertz, and they were using a wideband FM modulator and demodulator. And these machines had full response out to four megahertz, uh, like you need for TV broadcast at the time. They used FM uh, emphasis, pre-emphasis and de-emphasis to get better signal noise, just like on any FM radio system that you know of. This was the head they used. Um, this uh, sharp eyes will see this is really an RCA head, but here's the head wheel. There's slip rings that connect it to the electronics. There's usually a preamp right behind this head wheel. Uh, then a uh, at the top, uh, Ampex had a photo cell. RCA used a little thing called a tone wheel so that they could know where head one was when it went around. Um, this assembly over here is called the vacuum guide or the shoe. You can see a hose here. They have a vacuum pump hooked up to this thing, so it sucks the tape into that guide. And then uh, this head right here is called the control track, and it lays down a 240-cycle tone uh, to kind of like laying sprocket holes on the tape. Here's with the guide closed against the head, and the tape would lay in here and we'll look at that a little more when they put it in the machine it goes sideways uh the, the head wheel goes up against the tape there's that vacuum guide i mentioned control track head the audio is recorded later down the tape down here these are the audio heads um they're uh on this is an rca machine it had a simul play head on it so you could check the audio this was um, capstan and then goes back and again this is running at 15 inches per second the head wheel sideways looks like this there's four heads 90 degrees apart in man and then a vacuum guide to push the tape up against the head as it goes by so as these heads go by they're protruding out about one to three mils one to three thousandths of an inch and so as it goes around here it actually is distorting the tape as it goes by it in that guide and uh, there are a lot of adjustments you have to make that even if you just throw a tape on the machine to play it you still have to be sure these things are right now the, the manufacturer's job is to be sure these heads are 90 degrees apart and in fact when they started doing this that was a really hard thing to control and at one point they would actually ship the whole head wheel panel with the tape to whoever was going to play the tape back so it would work. Uh, they didn't have a way of compensating. Then pretty soon they came up with RF delay lines, RCA had them, and then uh, later uh, other means to compensate. But keeping the heads exactly 90 degrees apart was critical for interchange between the machine that recorded it and another machine that you want to play it back. Um, the other thing I'll mention is that as these heads are spinning against the tape at that high speed, they wear down. Uh, initially, they were a, a, an alloy, I think. Uh, most of them was called uh, alphanol, but it's a metal um, pole tip. And so there was friction, tremendous friction, and they wear down. And so you'd put a new head on the machine, and these would protrude out, protrude out about two and a half to three mils. And then as you run the machine, uh, they wear down. And when they got down to about one mil or less, you were it's time to change it. The interesting thing was the signal and noise would get a little better as the heads wore down, but then as they got really down, uh, its noise would go back up, or you'd have other problems. They would just fail or something or start clogging. Getting one of these heads rebuilt, head panels, went back to the factory. It cost in the 60s. I think it was around $1,500 uh, to get one of these panels rebuilt. So after you run the machine, you know, there's a cost per hour of running these machines. It was pretty steep. So broadcasters could do it, uh, but it wasn't cheap to operate these things. There was a lot of maintenance. This is the way the tape tracks were laid down on the tape. This is the audio track up here. It was a big, nice, fat audio track. Um, the electronics in the VR1000, I think, was identical to the Ampex 350 audio tape recorder. Down here is the control track. Um, there also, there's a sine wave recorded on there at 240 cycles. And then on field one, during the vertical interval, they would slam a big pulse on there. And that was put on the tape and you would actually develop the tape with magnetic developer and find that mark. And that's where you would uh, understand where to, to splice the next piece of tape so that you could go from one video frame to the next, kind of like splicing with the sprocket uh, holes and the uh, frame uh, gap between the frames on 35 millimeter film. But that edit pulse was put on electronically to help you find where to splice uh, these video tracks and slice across this tape. There's another small audio track in here called the Q audio, and that was just a low grade, like five kilohertz audio channel, um, not great signal and noise, but it was used to, you could put a microphone on the machine and talk into that track to uh, find Q marks. Later, uh, that was used for digital time code, things like that. 
in order to splice that tape, uh, they made a, a splicer that would allow you to de put the developer magnetic developer on the tape and then slice across it with a razor blade and look at this with a microscope. Um, so you could find it. There's the can of tape developer and some uh, aluminum tape that went on the back side of the tape to actually make a splice. Uh, before very long, uh, they had electronic ways of splicing these. So these became obsolete fairly quickly. But there were a lot of them, a lot of splices made uh, with these mechanical splicers. When you're playing back the machine, these uh, heads are spinning against the tape. So the RF comes on. There's about 16 lines of video recorded with every head pass. So they sequentially come off the tape as the head's spinning. And then there's circuitry in the machine to gate those pulses and multiplex them into one continuous FM uh, output. And that was done by looking at where the uh, tone, where the tone wheel or where the position is on the head um, as it's spinning and looking at separated sync off the tape to generate the switching uh, in the machine to make one continuous output with those four heads. So there's a little overlap on them, but it had to, uh, it, they would switch during the vertical blank, I'm sorry, during the horizontal blanking, um, sometimes right in the middle of horizontal blanking, and then the proc processing amplifier would replace the sink so you didn't see the glitch. There were other ways they did it later on. As I mentioned, when you stuck a tape on one of these machines, you push play and you had to do a lot of adjustments. Uh, this is where I mentioned the tape has to go up into that guide and it actually distorts the tape uh, as it's going uh, across the tape. And so uh, the, the tape has to be in and out. At a, at, so it distorts that tape the same amount as it did when it was being recorded. Otherwise, you get these jag effects like this in the picture. This is if the uh, penetration is less or more, the zigzags go one way or the other. Uh, later, it wasn't very long before uh, Ampex and RCA came up with an automatic servo that moved this head in and uh, actually moved the guide in and out about two thousandths of an inch to compensate state for this. So if you were uh, playing a tape that had different recording penetrations on it, it would automatically correct while you're playing the tape. Excuse me. You also had to run the, be sure the head was up and down in the guide properly. Um, and also, if somebody had recorded it, recorded the tape wrong, you had to compensate it. When when you're making one of these, setting one of these machines up, uh, Ampex and RCA made test tapes that were precision calibrated uh, test tapes. They were not cheap, and you would put that on the machine and play it. And when you played the tape, you would compensate out these adjustments I'm mentioning here. And then uh, once you got everything set, then you should be able to put a blank tape on the machine, record it, and it should then play back on somebody else's tape machine. That's always the name of the game with tape recorders is being able to interchange tapes. Um, as I mentioned, these as these heads wear uh, down, you have to keep compensating them electronically. Um, the guide servo adjusts for this mechanical, but the as the uh, head wears down, its inductance changes, so the RF equalization circuits have to be readjusted periodically, maybe uh, every uh, four or five days, something like that. You'd check it, um, particularly critical uh, in color more than the black and white, but the, they, they all had um, uh, equalization adjustments for each head that you would tweak. And also on the record current, you would have – uh, make recordings. Once you got the mechanical set up, you'd make recordings and understand that the record current was correct. They they put about three or four watts of RF into the head um, all at the same time to record as it's spinning against the tape and record. And you would have to make recordings where you would incrementally increase the record current a little bit at a time. Sometimes we'd talk into that microphone I mentioned for the Q track and say one, one and a half, two, two and a half, three, and you need to watch the RF level off of those heads when you played the tape back and say, okay, well, it got up to saturation. Uh, we'll leave it at setting three on that one and two, two and a half on this one. And you'd set those record currents as you uh, were uh, optimizing the RF current on each head. So in 1956, Ampex had a really good black and white machine. They're selling them as fast as they can make them to the industry. So 
these were black and white machines. So NBC purchased a few machines. They had bought one and had it at the NBC lab in New York City. And the RCA Princeton engineers came and looked this thing over. And after running a lot of tests, they found that the RF system that Ampex had for black and white was fine, but it wasn't going to work for color. So they went back to Princeton and developed a few things that were really instrumental in the history of quad. Between January and August of 57, the Princeton lab developed an entirely new FM modulator and demodulator system to reduce the differential phase and gain. The reason, and the second thing they did is they reduced the FM deviation. We'll look at that in a second because they had to get the differential phase and gain down, which was unacceptable for color originally. And then they found that FM had used a pretty wide deviation, which was a good choice at the time that they made, but it was just too wide to get good linearity uh, for color. So they narrowed it much to a much narrower deviation down to about one megahertz from about two and about three megahertz down to one. And that lower deviation got to be known as low band color. And later the, the, F simply uh, standardized the frequencies, but RCA pretty much nailed it uh, in 1957. And then the, the next thing they had to do was to figure out a way to create, uh, make the machine play color on color TVs. Everybody's color TV has this burst regenerator in it, and it has a fairly slow time constant. So with the tape jitter, they're constantly, uh, the color would just appear totally unlocked on a uh, TV set. So they had to build something that would stabilize the chroma, and they did. We'll talk about that a little more. So RCA demonstrates this VR1000 playing color to Ampex executives and a lot of people. And then Ampex said, okay, we'll cross-license you to build our machine. So RCA was in the quad tape machine as well. Um, incidentally, Ampex then incorporated that uh, RCA modulator demodulator into their machines. Uh, RCA was selling color uh, quad machines then in 1958. And also in 1958, um, NBC installed eight VR1000s at Burbank for time zone delay that had to be put in place in 58. And so they could play back color shows time delayed. They would record a half hour at a time of the shows. They rewind one machine and be recording on another. So they bought eight machines and they had some additional uh, RCA machines. And that was in Burbank. And those are somebody just posted a, um, a thing on uh, Eyes of a Generation. There's, there's an RCA, I'm sorry, an IRE journal out there that details all that Burbank operation. But they had, so they had uh, 10 machines uh, operating. Um, maybe 12 uh, operating there in Burbank that were colorized using that RCA method. Um, here's the monochrome deviation. This is the FM deviation Ampex was using from about 4.3 to 6.8 megahertz. RCA narrowed it down to about 5.3. Uh, three to six point three. I'm sorry, five and a half to six and a half is what Simpty came up with. RCA narrowed it down and then Simpty standardized it. So the point is they narrowed the deviation down and that was called low band color. This was uh, RCA's prototype machine they were working on. This was the production model, the TRT1A. They came out with 1958. And then uh, this is a TRT-1B that uh, Jay Ballard and I restored up at the Museum of Broadcast Technology. It's shown here playing a uh, black and white tape from, uh, uh, I don't know what year, but it's a, a low band monochrome um, tape. You can see the, the uh, electronics for the RF are up here and down here. Uh, down here is a... Uh, more um, switching circuitry over in these two racks on the right are the servos, the power amplifiers, which are big 60 watt PA amplifiers that drive the motor and the capstan on the machine, power supplies, uh, the guide servo, other things. So quite a few tapes. We have it hooked up to a couple of 30 amp breakers. You turn them on, wait about five minutes and push play and it will come up and play. This was the color processor that RCA made. A lot of people confuse this with heterodyne color on a umatic but it wasn't that at all um, all of the tape machines that were built from the beginning would record color uh, it, if you uh, particularly if you had them set up for low band deviation because this was called direct color you're recording the entire ntsc signal up to four megahertz on the tape um, but the problem is that you, when you try to play the tape back, it, the chroma is jittering due to uh, just the perturbations on the tape and, and the servo not being that stable on the tape. So you had to have something to stabilize the chroma. So RCA did this with what's 
call the heter they call the heterline processor. So they brought the video in, they split out the luminance here, zero to three megahertz, and just passed it out. So the output of this thing is playing uh, monochrome that's still got jitter in it. But we had to fix the color. So they they filtered out the whole chroma bandpass from three to four megahertz, feed it through a couple of mixer stages, and they have a circuit down here. It's kind of like the burst regenerator in a color TV, but it, it corrects itself every horizontal burst. It sets a new um, uh, stable uh, stable regenerated 358 that they can mix in and that's called the jittering 358 and then they have local 358 from your station sync generator comes in they mix these together so if the sync i'm sorry if the chroma starts to move one way on the vector scope the other mixer moves it back the other way by the same amount so within reason this thing then takes chroma that has been stabilized in phase jitter adds it back and you get a composite color output um, ampex did a similar thing um, they actually took an ntsc decoder which takes quite a few tubes uh, like a color tv and they build the same burst controlled oscillator like rca did here but then they demodulated the ntsc out into yiq and then they fed that into an ntsc encoder and came out with composite so the net result was exactly the same as the rca processor chrome is stable monochrome's jittering but you could watch it on a color set i don't think ampex sold very many i don't know what the rca one cost but when the whole tape machine vr1000 from ampex cost forty five thousand dollars list the color mod cost twenty thousand to go along with it so i don't know if they sold a whole lot but they had it and rca had it rca it seems to have sold quite a few of these machines with color this was the color chassis in the machine it was a sixth rack to the five that you saw earlier to do that color this was ampex's color machine uh, that they made with their um, decoder system um before very long, transistors overtook the industry, and in 61, uh, RCA introduced uh, the TR-22, which was an all-solid state machine, um, and uh, they sold quite a few of those. Those uh, are around. And so everybody's using this low-band color that I talked about, but there was a problem, and the problem is that when you added, this is what RCA was fighting when they first tried to make the uh, Ampex VR1000 play color. Um, the bandwidth is narrow. The deviation of the frequency of the FM is very close to the color subcarrier. And the result was you get a, what they call moray patterns, a kind of a herringbone that, that you could see across color bars. And they're constrained on this because the head technology at the time would only let them go up to 7 megahertz. So they couldn't move it up too far. But Ampex uh, continued research into FM system. I'm sure RCA was looking at it too. But Ampex came up with a very interesting innovation they called shelf working. And the idea was to move the frequency up, but how far do you have to move it up to get good results without killing yourself trying to make a very wide band uh, head system? So they um, did what the, they found some sweet spots on moving the frequency of deviation up. Um, what's causing this is that the, uh, I'll show you just a second, it's due to interference in the band pass itself. And they also added what they called a linear roll off FM filter to help improve the signal and noise. So Ampex would find that by moving the center frequency of the deviation up, the products would get worse, and then they would fall, and then they would rise, and then they'd fall. So they kept moving it up, and they landed over here for the uh, NTA system. They landed somewhere up here for uh, 443 subcarrier PAL systems. But by doing this uh, carrier shift of the FM up higher, uh, they really were able to reduce that moray in the picture and make a really good-looking color signal and noise. So this was the low band video I mentioned here from five and a half to six and a half, they moved it from seven to 10 megahertz. And to do that, they had to improve the head technology, revamp the RF systems. And, uh, but by doing that, now you've got room down here from the seven megahertz down to zero frequency for the sidebands. The problem is the, there are sidebands produced in the FM spectra when you do this fm deviation and they get lobbed off here at seven megahertz for that, that. but the the lower sideband is where you uh put all that all that chroma information resides but the trouble is 
when you modulate this low band with 358, the side bands reflect off zero and come back. And it creates a lot of uh, spurious mixing products in here that create that moray. And they, there's really no way to filter it out. The answer was what Ampex did was move it up in frequency. So they introduced in 1964 a machine called the VR2000 that implemented that high band technology and it fixed the color problem. Now, keep in mind, both of the, the low band and the high band still record the same bandwidth uh, of NTSC, but the problem was in the low band, you had these spurious products created by the color subcarrier in the FM spectra that were causing that signal and noise problem. <clears throat> so everybody jumps on the high band wagon RCA implemented high band versions of their machines. There was a TR22 high band. Uh, Ampex came out with a new machine in 66 called the VR1200. And they could put that 1200 electronics back in the old 1000s if you wanted to and high band them. Uh, RCA introduced a new high band VTR called the TR70. There was a company in Palo Alto called um, Allen Electronics and they were building solid state replacements to rebuild VR1000 tube machines, and they started building uh, high band modifications for there. They, they were using uh, recording heads made by Fernsey in Germany. Fernsey had a, a license to build quads machines, but they sold very few of them. But Visual was buying the heads from them, excuse me, that would do high band, and they could rebuild a complete VR1000 to solid state and turn it into high band. And then they introduced their own machines as well. So in 1966, Ampex, I'm sorry, RCA came out with their answer to the Ampex 2000 called the TR70. And then Allen had some machines. This was a uh, VR1000 that was rebuilt to solid state. So the tubes have been pulled out, and this is a transistorized machine, high band, that they sold. And then they also produced some higher uh, end machines as well for uh, high band. So that point, um, they... Right, you know, through that time, you had uh, the innovation of Ampex coming up with the recording. You had people making them in color. Uh, they a lot of machines out there running uh, videotape. They could, in general, interchange. You had um, uh, a lot of stations would upgrade to high band as soon as they could because you got better quality. But also, if you were playing commercials or shows or making shows, you wanted to get the best quality. So they would upgrade as soon as they could. But that all cost money. So it took some years to get transition from low band color to high band. George, did you ever know Bev Gooch? No, I don't know him. He and Eckhart Wilms worked at Ampex over there. And they were the ones that developed some of those recording heads. Of all the crazy things, Bev Gooch lives here in Knoxville, and um, he had quite a collection of stuff there and some stuff, and he told me, and we were talking about the heads on a quad machine, you know. I thought, well, what's involved in, you know, uh, you know repairing those things? And he said, no, he says, you don't understand. He said it takes about a million dollars worth of equipment to refurbish those heads and um there used to be about three manufacturers that used to do those and then it went down to two and i think there's barely one now and now when they have to transfer tapes they charge like 300 dollars a half hour to transfer quad tapes there because those heads have a finite life of about 750 hours plus or minus depending on how you take care of them they used to only run between 100 and 300 hours. If you used used to be when if you got 300 hours on one of those heads, you celebrated and broke out the champagne. But they uh, uh, they didn't last very long back when they were metal. Once they started making ferrite heads and things, they last a lot longer. But uh, in the, the 60s and early 70s, um, uh, they, they you change in heads and adjusting them all the time. Uh, do they? Is there still anybody around that's refurbishing those? I know they used to charge like fifteen hundred dollars to do a head, and no, my last no, understanding, no. it's about thirty five hundred now. I think it's more than that. Somebody online, I'm sure, knows. Uh, as I understand it, uh, video magnetics closed down, and there aren't. There's no one left. Uh, George, a couple things. RCA had a uh, radar recorder out on Kwajalein that did the longitudinal at the whatever that high super high speed was 
record radar data, and they, that was kind of the same thing that they were doing with the, with the longitudinal video. Uh, I did look up while you while we were talking. I found the price list for uh, the rack for color for the um, TRT ninety five hundred dollars in sixty eight. Okay. Uh, Ampex yeah. was uh, nineteen thousand five hundred in nineteen fifty eight. No, that was on a that was on a price list that they were closing <laughs> stuff out, but they said it was ninety eight hundred dollars. Got it. Um, the the other thing is uh, the portable machine that RCA was selling as the equivalent of a VR three thousand was actually a military machine that was an octaplex, eight tracks on the head. So that it was used uh, for military purposes. And I understand RCA had them on uh, TR-70s or something like that that did that. And I don't know if the FR-1000 by Ampex was that or not. I don't know. There was a whole product line that RCA made. They looked like those quad machines, like the TR-70 and those, but they were data recorders, not video recorders. And um, there are actually in uh, on World Radio History, there's uh, one of the issues of um, – RCA engineer on there has a whole big spread on it. They even made a TCR 100 part machine that was a data recorder, not a video recorder. So yeah, there were various applications of using that rotary head with more than four heads and, uh, and for non video purposes, but for just high speed data. And uh, Ray Dolby, I believe he was in high school when he was uh, and came in uh, to work on the BR 1000 project. Um, and Fred P.F., however you pronounce it, I, blew, I was told that he's still alive. I was told he might join us tonight. I wish he would. Uh, we'd love to talk to him, Fred Faust. Yeah, he was the machinist that did a lot of the machine work. Uh, I was very fortunate I met Charlie Ginsburg, and Charlie Anderson was uh, somebody that I met and a wonderful man. Um, I met him once when I was just starting in this. He remembered who I was. Uh, whenever I saw him, he would greet you like you were the best friend, and he'd known you forever and ever, and you were a good person. And I even arranged to have him come into Detroit for a empty uh, presentation. And uh, so a very good man. Uh, the other manufacturers, I know Ferency, that last picture that you showed of the Allen machine, the one on the right was a Ferency uh, quad. Well, it was a Fernsey transport in an Allen machine. Yeah, uh, um, yeah, and uh, but Shabadin, or however uh, they did. Yeah. Um, the Russians had one, and then there was uh, supposedly there was a, um, a Hitachi or somebody had one that they they did the slow mo on quad, which was. I saw the paper on it and I couldn't believe how they could do it, but uh, uh, that was uh, another company that supposedly did it. But the primary ones were uh, Shabadin, uh, Perense, and the Russians uh, outside of Ampex and RCA. And I, I consider the, the visual and the uh, Merlin, et cetera, those were just uh, modifications of other people's. Well, they made their own electronics. I mean, Allen made their own servos. They made their own RF systems, um, all those solid state equipments in there. They did buy Amtec, Colortec, and so forth from Ampex, which raised the cost of their machine for them to make them that way. Um, at the very end, uh, their machines used Shabadin, uh time-based correction stuff, and uh, they sold a few machines, but about the time uh, – you know, high band was going, uh, visual electronics themselves declared bankruptcy and that shut down the whole, uh, Allen thing, but they had built a slow-mo machine. They had a small machine, kind of like the RCA TR five. They had that big machine they called uh, VA 100 that used the Fernse transport and head. They were using Fernse high band heads initially because Fernse had the first rotary transformer high band heads. And, uh, so those worked. And then when, uh, uh, visual went bankrupt. You couldn't get the Fernse heads anymore, so you had to uh, convert the machines over to the Ampex heads, and that required pulling the transport out of the machine, getting it remachined, 
uh, so it would fit the Ampex head and put everything back together again. So um, there were a number of them around. They they were not as expensive as the Ampex and RCA machines is why they were selling them. Well, the interesting, you mentioned TR5. I had one of them. Um, it was an interesting machine. And you could put an air conversion kit on it too, by the way. Uh, yeah, even the, the TRT1 at MBT has, uh, is plumbed for air. If we just run a ball bearing head on it instead of um, air, but it will take air as well. And that, that machine's in good shape. The, um, the other thing is that Ampex had the VR1100E, which looked like it was the same style as a TR5. The, Transport was flat, and the electronics were below it. And so it was basically a mobile thing, recorder that you could have. Yeah. No scopes, no nothing like that, but it was just, it was there. And so that was kind of an interesting thing. And I believe somebody told me that the 1100 from Ampex, they used servos and signal systems from the 8000, which they tried to do a, a helical two-inch machine, and it Bomb, shall we say. Okay. George? Yes, sir. Uh, it's Mike Molnar. I wanted to, I was curious as to what the maintenance schedule was on these machines. How many hours of uptime until you had to actually tear it down and go through a lot of this stuff and how long that took? Well, I don't know. Um, I, that's a great question. That's a great question. <laughs> I, um, I, I never... Uh, I know people would take these machines and there were AF associates in New Jersey and Merlin out in California that would take machines and rebuild them. Um, I guess I never worked any place that would do that. Um, we always just did them piecemeal, whatever would break on the machine. We'd, we'd change it. Uh, the, the main thing you had to keep, um, swapping out was the head panels if they went bad. Um, but then you had the normal things, the brakes, uh, um, motors and things like that most of them you know held up for a long time um so uh i i don't remember ever changing real motors or anything like that i suppose somebody might have had them go bad but it was always uh these machines were every place i worked on them they ran them almost 24 hours a day until they quit and then once they quit, you would fix it or, you know, you would do periodic maintenance of check those settings. You know, like I mentioned, record currents and playback EQ to be sure that the operators had things in the middle of their range and stuff like that. But um, the machines I worked with, the uh, RCAs and the Allens, uh, you, they're pretty much hands off until something wasn't working. And then you just have to stop and fix them, find what was wrong, um, get them adjusted, you know, uh, up and uh and go on because they they were money making machines and uh, you just had to keep them uh, running as long as you could uh i had a maintenance schedule for the uh ampex 1200s and the avr2s of uh, every 25 hours basically you would um sit and uh do a head optimization so that you had uh good uh record and playback and we did everything as tight as we could to an alignment tape, so you really didn't have to touch the heads after you after you did all that. The other thing was, I think it was every hundred hours, or if the twelve uh, hundreds would not lock up in less than four seconds, we'd be going through and doing a complete servo alignment. And we we were hoping to get a three second lockup all the time on those. Most people were five seconds if they were lucky. Well, they, you're right. They should lock up in three seconds. I've never dealt with, I don't know of many machines that won't lock up in three seconds if you uh, take care of them at all. Um, set the tensions and that sort of thing. But the, um, and machines like a TR70C, those will lock up in a half a second to a second. Um, AVR ones, of course, lock up instantly, but these are machines that don't have vacuum columns john might jump in with what the avr3 does but most of the old classic analog servo machines would uh, uh if they didn't lock you're right if they didn't lock up in three seconds there was something wrong and you should take a look at them um I, I, even when i worked at nbc we had a room with about 10 cr70s and two tcrs and again they just ran them i uh, i 
would work on them after hours uh, on the night shift and uh, do any mods or tweaks or anything like that. Um, and but they they ran them, you know, uh, you know, on the order of twenty hours a day or so. And um, again, we just ran them until uh, something needed to be done. Uh, we would still uh, periodically, you know, I could. When you adjust those head settings, like you mentioned, you can set them up, but then the next thing you know, an operator throws a tape on the machine that has um, been recorded badly or on a machine that wasn't set up, and they mess up all the head adjustments. So about everybody has to know how to throw a tape on the machine and uh, look at the, an alignment tape or a dub of an alignment, good dub of an alignment tape and get it lined up. Uh, the only machines that, that did, you didn't have to is like a TCR 100 cart machine, and we didn't talk about those. But um, as long as uh, people kept their uh, hands off the guide height and stuff like that, they would they would stay put. But mostly people would have to tweak things or ne- think they needed to tweak them in order to optimize the playback of a machine. And uh, that would cause you to have to um, retweak it uh, when you started making a good recording. You wanted to check it and be sure it was OK. One of the things that we did in the editing, because we were doing editing, uh, one machine was always the record machine and the others were the play. That record machine before a session, you would check the guide heights against an alignment tape. We had a, we'd chop off one minute so that we didn't ruin the alignment tape and keep, keep running it. And, and it was amazing if you take and do that, anything you made on there, you put it on the other machine. If you hadn't touched it, it played perfectly. Um, we were very, much into making sure we met specifications, even to the point of sliding the um, edit pulse a little bit one side or the other so that it tracked exactly as the alignment tape did. Yeah, I, that's a, another critical thing to set up. One other thing I didn't mention when I was talking about the head wheels as they wear down, um, when you, you can't fix this really, but when uh, if you record a tape with a head that's brand new, let's say, and it's got three mils of projection, two and a half mils. And then as that tape wears down, um, it's down to, you know, maybe one, one and a half mils of projection on the hip head. And, and actually when it's doing that, now the head to tape speed is different. In other words, when you have a, a, a tape, it's recorded on a head that's got large normal protrusion at fully new head. And then you play it back on one that's got less tip projection that means that the head to tape speed is different and what happens is that that is called velocity error and there isn't anything you can adjust about that Um, in the old days we would have to take a tape and try it maybe if you had a couple of machines in the place you would try the tape that you're playing back on one machine or the other and see which one had the, the least error and the way it manifested itself is there was a huge shift from the left to the right across the picture um, and that was because the uh, head tape speed was different between the tape that re- the recorder and the playback so ampex came out with another ten thousand dollar accessory and rca came out with an expensive accessory but they fixed the problem it would electronically compensate by sampling the burst at each end of the line and then be developing a uh, ramp function across the screen to tweak the subcarrier as the line played out from left to right across the screen and compensate for that velocity error but that was another thing that that it was um, it's something you couldn't adjust out. It was just a function of the uh, headwear. Looks like John's got it back online here. I, I would I would disagree with you, George, because the penetration of the head into the tape is if it's consistent with the alignment tape, it doesn't matter. The velocity is going to be the same as it goes down the tape. I believe. Okay. I, uh, and but the velocity errors are. Height and and uh, of the guide and penetration dares from where it was recorded. Okay, I'm done. Uh, George, in my collection of stuff, I've got a two inch tape machine, a small one. I think many of them were used in airlines where they would play movies, and it's like a linear tracking machine. Are you uh, familiar with those? That's a PB one hundred and twenty. Yeah, it's a Sony. Yeah, John can tell you all about those. Yeah, there was a facility in Long Island called Video Flight, and uh, I think Sony paid for it. And it had uh, 60 PB120s, which is a two-inch helical scan machine. I have one here. 
Um, and on each airplane, they had a, a, uh, a VTR, the same machine. They were about 130 pounds. They would play a one-hour tape, and they put eight-inch black-and-white televisions hanging from the overhead uh, luggage bins every few rows. It was quite a mess, and it, but it, uh, it did the job until uh, uh, Barco came along with their uh, loop cartridge uh, film projectors. Uh, but yeah, that goes back to about 62. I worked on that when I was in college. Yeah, uh, those machines were not color. Uh, mm -hmm. Helical color didn't come along until about 1970. Um, and there was all kinds of tricks. Uh, it, it, we got to do one inch one of these days because I've got a, a, I must have a hundred of those things. Yeah, yeah uh, I'm, a, uh, I'm a graduate double E. Uh, I've been working with television since I was a little kid. My father and I built a a, a television in 1947 uh, from a kit. Um, and I, I learned about high voltage and 6BG6s and 1B3s really early. I was about four years old. I got bit a few times. So anyway, uh, that bug kind of stuck with me, uh, even though I went to a, a classic college for engineering. Uh, I spent most of my, my time growing up playing with this stuff and um uh after after school or actually before that uh, i started a system integration building in new jersey which is where i am right now and uh we've had a, a pretty good run of it so uh, uh that's where i am today so I, i'm in a building here in uh, northern new jersey that we built in 1990 2000 uh and it's full of stuff <laughs> uh there's a lot of people would like me to get rid of it but uh for now, uh, it's here. So I'm in the lobby of my building, and I'll show you a couple of things before we move around and look at particular machines. So um, uh, let me get this little camera here. All right, so starting over here, uh, we won't uh, do too much here, but I've got a collection of one-inch machines, starting with a, a digital one-inch. Can you one share your screen? Oh, I don't know how to do that. Let's see. Tell me how to do that, guys. Oh, uh, you know, you're good, John. Let me just uh, let me just make sure that you stay. Uh, hang on, let me uh, spotlight you there. Oh, and... there we go. Excellent. Okay. All right. So I've got a collection. These are one-inch machines. Maybe someday in the future, Dave will have us do a one-inch thing. So I've got I got probably a hundred of these. Uh, there's there's a high def analog one-inch machine that doesn't record any anything digital. It's all analog. Um, and there's an early, uh, an early Sony C format machine that uh, uh, so RCA sold in the U.S. Pretty much put Sony in business here. There's a digital one-inch component machine. All right, let's take a look at this. This is an RCA TR5. Uh, it's probably the first. I guess we won't call it portable. Let's call it mobile uh, quad recorder. Um, it uh, it records. It doesn't play back. Uh, it's a low band mono machine, but as George mentioned, uh, the tapes that this made, if they were recorded with color input, would probably play back on one of those later modified VTRs. Uh, but let's take a look at the head assembly. Now, this is what George had in his uh, picture. One of the things I want to show you that I've always found interesting is I don't know if you can see it, but on this uh, on this shoe down here. Somebody actually machined in an RCA. Uh, where is it? They machined in an RCA meatball. I always found that to be fascinating. I have no idea why they did that. I mean, think about somebody trying to pay for that today. But anyway, this is the uh, ball bearing head wheel. Here's the tone wheel in the back. Uh, this is the female guide for the tape. And this is a, a vacuum hose that pulls the tape into that con concave shape. Uh, the, the four heads uh, output to a set of brushes over here, and they're carbon brushes up against slip rings. And this, uh, this was around for a while, but that tend to, tends to get very noisy after a while. So that got replaced with a rotary transformer. Uh, the audio is over here. And that's pretty much it for this guy. Uh, doesn't require any uh, any compressed air. All the machines after this 
had to have a compressor either in it or in, in your house to uh, drive it. And you needed about 50 pounds per square inch and about one to two static uh, CFM uh, to run these things. So that's that. The other interesting thing is this reel says, for Lawrence Wilk shows only. So I guess I know what that machine was for. We'll take a look at this. This is a uh, this is the last machine that Ampex uh, designed. I don't think it's the last one they sold because their predecessor to this, the AVR2, uh, lasted a lot longer in the market. Uh, this machine had a number of, 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 of interesting features. Um, I want to show you one in the back that's online, and we'll thread it and run it a little later when we go back to the shop. Um, it's a, it doesn't it doesn't play low band, uh, and it doesn't play low band color. It's a high band color machine only. The electronics are down below. Uh, it it's very easy to service. This pops out, and there's all your boards. Uh, it's, a, it's quite a nice piece of work. Another nice thing is there's no pinch roller on the uh, cap stand. It just it uses vacuum to pull the tape against it. And then it uses a tightly coupled servo system on the real motors so that the uh, tape is fed out and t taken up uh, depending on where the cap stand is. So basically the, 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 the drive mechanism and the shuttle mechanism only really operates on the cap stand, and the reels just follow along. And that's a that's a very interesting uh, thing that they did. Now over here, we have a an RCA machine. This is the last model that RCA built called TR six hundred A. This particular machine came out of a NBC TV station in New York State. Um, it's got a lot of hours on it. Uh, it's uh, it's high band color. But it will play low band. Um, it, it has a spotty reputation because uh, there's a lot of monostables inside this thing. And as anybody knows, when they get warm, they change. So uh, that probably wasn't the best way to build timing circuits. All right. I think that's it for here. We're going to go in the other room now. Hang on. Here's an Ampex portable. This is a, a, a VR3000. It's a high band machine. It will record high band or low band. Um, it holds a 20 minute reel of two inch tape. The head is a, uh, a Mark 11, which was a ball bearing head. Um, I'll fire it up and let you listen to it. I'm not going to play any video of it, but I'll let you hear. The the uh, the power is a uh, battery is a is a battery uh, well here. You pull this AC supply out and drop a battery in. I think they were silver zinc and they would run for about 25 minutes or so. Uh, this thing, let's see. Here she goes. So the, the head does not have, it does not need air, but it does need vacuum. So there's a pump inside. You might be able to hear that. Um, these are pretty popular because when you push the stop button, it rewinds and it does that so that it can make a clean insert or assemble edit at the point when you start recording again. All right, let me turn that off. All right, so RCA built one like this, but theirs, theirs was a two-piece machine and it was not something you could, you could, you could easily carry around with. You had to put on a cart. Uh, one of the things... That <laughs> Ampex did was they have a they had an advertising piece which shows a cameraman with a with an aluminum uh, a rig on him uh, with this thing on his back and a camera on his chest and I, I'd love to know <laughs> what that guy had for breakfast it's uh, it's uh, and, and this thing weighs a bit I can I can't hardly lift it it weighs about eighty pounds with the with the battery in it amazing all right let's go over and take a look over here. Here we have another RCA 600A. This particular machine uh, is uh, meant to work on the uh, on American Power. It's a 60 cycle machine, but it only records and plays PAL and C camp, so it will not work with not work with uh, NTSC. 
Um, then over here, this is an Ampex AVR2, and it's probably the most popular machine that Ampex ever made. Uh, it could be assembled in various ways. The, the mechanism on top here uh, comes out, comes out of the side uh, panels come off. This thing can be carried by two guys with these handles on the side. And then the processor down below plugs into the top with a couple of cable umbilicals. So uh, these were really popular in uh, in mobile units when their power was available in place of the uh, the portable because you can record a, a, a two hour reel or now a 90 minute reel of tape with this thing. Uh, let's see, what else can I tell you about this? Um, this particular one is a late machine. This came out of ABC New York. This has an electronic tape counter in it. This was also a, a later development. The early machines were uh, used a, a mechanical uh, Vita root type counter, but this one is electronic. And that was actually worked to be part of an editing option for this machine where you could, you could record time code on the Q channel and then edit the tapes. All right. So that's, t I think, uh, I think that's what I want to show you out front. All right, uh, Dave, can you take this back? And I'm going to roll this thing in the back. This is a VR1000. It's the machine George talked about. Um, it um, It is a the C version, which was the last, sh I guess, shop run of them. Um, the electronics were in these two racks, which I just sent out, had them cleaned up and repainted because they were a mess. Uh, all the chassis are down here. And the machine's 100% vacuum tube. There may be a couple of diodes in it, but even the, uh, uh, in fact, I think the rectifiers are solid state. The the uh, the drivers, the driver tubes for the head and record were EL34s. So uh, as George said, it took quite a bit of power, or they, they ran quite a bit of power into the heads uh, when they were, this machine was in record. Um, so this is intact. I have all the parts. I just, again, Time is my enemy here. I just don't haven't had time to get it back together again. But um, there's a few of these still around. I, I think uh, I think the museum in, in Rhode Island has a, a B version, and I think they also have one that has been modified and has all the electronics in the overbridge. Okay, and it has the same head design as the as the uh, RCA. Um, it's got. Uh, Vacuum, uh, the vacuum pump in the bottom. There's the same head arrangement and uh, the ball bearing motor. And uh, that's that's pretty much it. The, those machines were were pretty similar in a lot of a lot of ways. All right, let's go back over here a minute. This is another AVR2. This machine is in pretty good shape. Uh, it came from a TV station in Binghamton. Um, took a little work to get it get it running. But uh, it makes really good pictures, and I can see why they were very popular with stations when they came out. Not not just because of the portability, but the fact that the electronics were all digital. And um, this was one of the first machines where the, the video off the demodulator was converted to data, and then re and then run through a a, a, a time based corrector in the in the digital form. Uh, and they could do a number of things. They could do velocity correction in that in that domain too. All right, let's take a look further down here. And here's an RCA TR60. This is one of the last vertical machines that RCA built. Uh, they went from the TR3 and 4 to the TR50 to this one, and then one more called the 61, which which came after this. Uh, this one came out of a chicken coop in uh, Delmarva, and uh, it was in pretty rough shape. It, it's pretty corroded on the inside, but it actually makes pretty good pictures. It's got KVEC in it and a DOC, and those were, uh, again, things that were added uh, after a while to the, these machines. The early machines didn't have dropout correction and didn't have uh, chroma amplitude correction. All right, let's go over and take a look at the... Um, at the uh, at the AVR3, it's hooked up here. This is a, a late model Ampex AVR3. Um, again, the electronics for this are all in the, works in the drawer. Oh, that's that. 
Uh, one extender board allows you to fix them all, which was a nice, nice design. All the power supply test ports are right here in the front. Uh, again, these things were built by guys who knew you had to maintain them at a station. Uh, the, on the right side, we have all the electronics. The, the uh, time base corrector is over here. And the playback and record controls are over here. All right. So what I have here is uh, got a sync generator fired it, powering up the machine. And I got this monitor on the output. This monitor uh, blew up this morning. It's a Tektronix 650, and they're well known for blowing up power supplies. So let's thread it up and run it very briefly. Okay. So put the camera back. All right, so down here on the floor, I've got a kick switch, which just reduces the, takes the brakes, turns the brakes off on the wheels, so they spin nice and smoothly. So what we'll do is bring the tape up. Some guys can do this with their eyes closed. And when this is set, we'll get some we'll get some uh, some vacuum uh, showing up in uh, inches of mercury, inches of water on the gauge here. And uh, on this machine, it wants to be set to about thirty-five, so we can adjust that. Um, this machine has a head wheel uh, called an Apex Mark 15. It was shared with the AVR2, which was a great thing. Um, you can change. This thing says play. There's also a record setting. This changes the setting of the guide depth away from the tape. And then there's a control here, which which adjusts the penetration of the uh of a guide in the, this direction. There's another one that adjusts the, the in and out. And I'm going to show you what that looks like on a monitor. Okay, so this is set. Let's see if it works. Okay, and you probably heard the head wheel come up. It's running at 14,400 RPM. This is an air bearing motor. I've got uh, a house air system here. Uh, so I'm bringing air down from my upstairs uh, uh, compressor room, and it runs around the whole building so I can put machines any place. So we'll leave that open for a minute, close the audio head, and we'll just pop it into play, and we'll see how long it takes for a picture to come up when it gets to a recorded part of the stage. Now, what we Your camera's pointing at the ceiling. Oh, sorry, guys. So, obviously, this head's a little dirty. And those artifacts you're looking at are very normal to quad machines. Um, on the on the AVR1, a lot of that will uh, will be taken care of. I'm going to show you that last. Um, now, if I go over to this monitor, that's the demodulator output. And as you can see, uh, the color isn't usable for anything. Also, if I misadjust this guide, you can see the, the change. That's what George was talking about earlier, where the, the guide has to be set to the same location as it was when the paper was recorded. Okay. Now, after that, after the electronics get busy, the output of the machine looks like that. This machine has a time code system in it, and it records simply time code on the Q channel, which you can hear. The simply code sounds like. Okay. So, uh, if I clean those heads, I can get rid of that mess that you're looking at out there. But I have to stop and unthread it. So anyway. 
with many VHS units now having experience. Now, this, several years. this particular machine has one very interesting feature, which is rare. The audio system on it is stereo. Uh, what they did was they took the standard audio head under here and they, they, they split it just like you do on, a, on an audio recorder where you're going to go from half track to quarter track. Um, and at the, you know, because the quality of the tape has gotten so much better than it was in 1956, uh, and the electronics are very good. And uh, there was also connectors on this machine to add Dolby A noise reduction if you wanted. So uh, this machine could be used for uh, stereo. In fact, I have a couple of tapes uh, that are uh, recorded with this particular stereo system. Um, there were all kinds of other tricks. Some people tried to use the Q channel. Uh, some people tried recording left plus right and left minus right. Uh, but I think this was the only one that actually was sold as a product. All right. So I think that's it for this. Let me, let me uh, move around to one more location. I'm going to show you one more machine. Let's stop this. Turn the head off. The time-based corrector in the uh, ABR3 uses almost exactly the same boards as in an ABR2. And uh, then the uh, stereo audio, I think the first time it was stereo was somebody modified in an ACR25 at MTV to do that. But uh, And it was vertical interval, I think. John Streets at Merlin, I think, did that. What well, was the model number of that airline uh, tape machine that I've got? Uh, that was called a PV120. Okay. And they're, they're, they're quite rare now. I've got, I've got a 100, which was an earlier one uh, in, in one of our shops, but uh, I don't have a 120. I've been looking for one for years. Um, okay. This is the kind of a, the granddaddy of all quad machines. I think most people who worked in broadcasting would agree that the AVR1, which is what this is, uh, was kind of the the uh, the best of the breed. Um, what made it the best of the breed was a lot of innovative things were done. Uh, first of all, in the signal system, uh, the machine is automatic sensing. You can put a tape on it, and it doesn't matter how it was recorded. It'll, it'll figure it out and set itself. That's kind of cool. Uh, the other thing is, It'll play a tape without a control track. You just go over here and put the track against the, the full stack of pivot. And uh, what it does, is it, 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 it jitters the RF envelope by, by jittering the head wheel face. And then it measures that and it adjusts it until it peaks it. It's kind of the same principle that Amtex did in the AST design for their one inch machines. Uh, now, um, the other things that are interesting is the the um, time base corrector. Go over here in the bottom. Uh, this thing uses digitally switched delay lines. The, the it's there's nothing digital about the video, uh, which is one of the reasons why the machine looks so good. Uh, what they do is they they put it on a thirty or sixty megahertz carrier, and they run it through delay lines. And then they switch them on and off in the vertical interval. So there's delay lines for 32, 16, 8, and 4 microseconds to 1 microsecond. And then there's a vernier for the color. Uh, so that was, that was very innovative. Let me close this guy up. Uh, the next thing that's clever is the, is the way that tape tensioning works. You'll notice that again, like the ABR3, there's no there's no pinch roller here, just a just a cap stand that had vacuum on it. Let's open this guy up. Thank you. Okay. So now what they did in here it had an array of light bulbs, and at the top they had an array of photo detectors. When you thread the tape up, it comes up into this chamber, and there's vacuum pumps down below which suck the tape in. And by measuring where it is, 
in the chamber and adjust the tension on the on the reel to keep the tape centered in there. Um, that that is a, a very clever thing. They did the same thing in the ACR twenty five, although the chambers were much smaller. Um, this works really well, and uh, the only thing that happens is the light bulbs in here uh, burn up and you have to replace them. And the glass is special, so you you can't you can't just go to a hardware store and buy a piece of glass if you break these things. They're they're coated with something special. Uh, there's a an electrical coating on them as well. I don't I don't even know what they did. I do have a field bolt that it talks about it, but it's complicated. Uh, another nice feature is the head wheel. On the other machines, there are three screws to get the head out. On this one, you push a button in and bring your head. So if something happens in the middle when you're on the air, you can just pull it out, put a new one in. And I get it in the right place. I need two hands for this. No, I did it. <laughs> I'll have to work with that later. So anyway, uh, that's that. Uh, the top of the machine has space. This usually comes with, came with a black and white monitor. We put a color monitor in here. Since the machine is multi, the machine will play PAL and CCAM too. It'll play 50 cycle or 60 cycle. And it'll play low band, high band, low band color. Uh, it's got all these different modes here. And you can set them, you can put the machine to automatic, let it figure it out, or you can force it to whatever you'd like. Uh, it's also a two speed machine. Most of the quads were two speed. Uh, but it'll, it'll record a seven and a half if you want, which will double your tape time. Um, I'm not sure what else I can tell you about it. When you pull this out, uh, there's the all the air system right in front of you, uh, because you do have that that vacuum column for the tape tension. So you need to make sure that uh, all these uh, pressures and vacuum are in the right right place. Well, let's close that up. Okay, uh, the uh, air system is down here, and that's the vacuum. That's a vacuum pump uh, for those air columns. And uh, this one used to have a compressor for the head, but it's been taken, it was taken out before I got it. And uh, I run it off my house air. So, uh, any questions? On my PV120, what type of a head design did it have? Oh, that was that's a very good question because it was very interesting. Uh, it was a uh, relatively well, if we had time, I could show you the machine. Uh, it had it had two heads. It had a video head and another one called a sink head. And the sink head was only in contact with the tape for maybe twenty percent of the time, just enough to over just enough to make sure that all of the the uh, uh, television uh, frame was recorded. Um, what the, the selling point that they had for that machine was uh, if when the video head wears down and they wore down very fast because it was an alloy head, like George mentioned earlier, uh, you could pull the sink head out and swap it with the video head and you're back in business right away. Uh, I thought that was clever. Uh, uh, heads weren't, I remember, I, Sony New York used to be in Long Island City. And I, I tell you, every once every two weeks, I used to go over there and get heads. So it got to the point where the, the, the service manager knew I was coming. He said, oh, John, you know where those parts are. Go back and get them and sign them out. <laughs> That's how Sony was back in the day. So. so it's a very rare machine in itself? Yeah. Uh, again, there were. Uh, it's, I should probably... Uh, qualify this. There were two different models. 
uh, the, the, the first one was called a PB100. And the tape ran at, I think, five and a quarter inches per second. Uh, it had a custom, a very special uh, hub to mount. And they didn't make, it, it, there was only two tapes sold. It was a half hour and a one hour, and that was all there was. Um, the, uh, after, and this was probably around 1962. In, in uh, later years, 65, uh, they had this machine called a PB120, which recorded at a slower speed, but you could put more stuff on the tape. Um, they they built that to compete with the Ampex 660B, which was another two inch machine with a relatively large drum, um, which would I think it ran at three inch or something like that. And that thing would record on a roll of uh, a, 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 a large roll of tape. Uh, you could get five hours of recording on that machine, mm. and they were very popular. They were used in a lot of. You remember what ITFS systems were? Anybody remember that? That was an uh, instructional television fixed service. It was a 2.4 gigahertz uh, FM uh, radio. I, I had four channels of it. Okay, well, then you know what it is. So the ITFS people love that 660. They used them everywhere because they were stable enough to broadcast. This is before how, many of those, how many of those machines do you think they manufactured? Which, which one, the Ampex or the, the Sony's? The, the Sony PB120s? Um, I, I can tell you, in the East Coast here, I put a bunch of them into Western Electric factories in, right, between 1964 and 1967, probably a dozen of them. Um, and that was probably the biggest customer they had. I don't think, I don't think very many of those were sold. Uh, and they're really hard to find. I, haven't, I have not found them. I've been looking for another 120 for 50 years, and I haven't found one yet. Well, maybe if you have something to trade me, <laughs> <laughs> we might talk about that. Yeah, well, I got a building full. Is it, does it work? <laughs> I, it, it, well, it's it looks very nice. I'll put it that way. I've never tried to operate it. I didn't. Uh, I did put it away, and I haven't looked at it in a long time. But I do know where it is in my stuff. But yeah, I need to drag that thing out and bring it to ETF sometime if you go there. Yeah. Okay. All right. We'll have to talk. Okay. Thank you very much. Sure. I have I have an interesting piece of literature from May of 1973, the Ampex price list. Oh, and, yeah. Uh, you can get a VR1200B in color for $69,950, 70K. Uh, ABR1 in color, $110,000. <laughs> so don't you wish you could get it at the end it was all, it was a, a, a whole bunch more uh the uh, and that was without any of the accessories you know that uh hey, chris did they sell ever sell an abr1 monochrome i don't know but they listed as uh 102,000 dollars uh uh 102,000 monochrome you know, maybe it was sold in some country that didn't have color at that time. You know, it, I mean, I'm pretty familiar with the electronics in this machine. And I got to tell you, the the the, uh, the color circuitry is so stitched in to everything else. I can't imagine how they could do that. Uh, neither do I. And um, But it, it, was, it was interesting uh, yeah. to, to look at this. But, you know, the... Yeah. Uh, there's who was uh, mentioning uh, who was mentioning the uh, the MTB stuff before because I worked on that project. Uh, Merlin Engineering, I thought, did a uh, a stereo. Kit. No, Merlin was not involved in that. Um, the The machines were bought by Andy Sitos, and he sent them to Toshiba Ampex. Uh, Ampex had a long standing cross licensing deal with Toshiba in Japan. So three of those, there were three AVR uh, twenty uh, ACR twenty fives. They went over to Japan. Toshiba put custom heads in them and custom electronics and sent them back. And Andy put Dolby A on them, and that's how the that's how the MTV went on the air. Okay, I'm totally out the lunch. Typical for me, <laughs> but uh, interesting. Autochroma on an AVR one was six thousand bucks. Auto tracking was. 
uh, three thousand um, bucks. So you know you could you could spend a lot of money uh, on an ADR yeah. one, and that was uh, before you ended up uh, uh, with the price increases due to inflation and all the other stuff. Well, it, 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 every one of these machines supposedly was wired for every possible option that they had. Uh, I have this machine's got everything in it except for the editor card, and. Um, uh, I, I think the editor card needed to have this contr- a special control panel here too, which I don't have. Yeah, so, that, that did a different control. Pa- it's the same control panel in an ACR twenty five. Um, uh, I've got two of those also. Sorry, I didn't get to show them, but I have a pair. Of, I have a twenty five and a twenty five B. So, and the, so an actual twenty five exists now. Oh, I, I yeah, it's, it's in it's intact. It works. Ah, nice machine. I got a TCR. Anybody know where I can get an SP100 for that thing? Nope. <laughs> no. Well, if you got a TR70, you... I got two of them. No, I. That's that's how my TCR was set up. Uh, I have a TR70C with the the master kit in it, and um, the uh, when I connect it up, the only thing is you need six. 30 amp circuits to turn the whole mess on. Yeah. Well, well, the time I worked with an ACR 25 at the station, we had dropouts go over and I, do you have alignment tape? They were down to like a quarter mil was all that was left on all four heads on the two <laughs> machines. We need some heads. <laughs> Nobody ever checked that stuff. But, but it's interesting. Um, uh, an NTSC PAL AVR CCAM one was 117 grand for an AVR one. Really? Yeah. And this is in 1973. Yeah. Yeah. Don't. <laughs> yeah. This is this particular machine. Um, George knows the history of this too. This machine was was at PBS in Washington, and it was in uh, there was a structural building fire around 1986. As I recall, I'm not sure if George was 84, 86, sometime in there. So all of these machines, they, they had a pile of these and they had a, about 25 VPR2s. And all these were pulled out. And the VPR2s were cleaned up and, and put back into service. The, 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 the AVR1s disappeared because it was the end of the line for quad. So um, there were four of these machines which meandered around the East Coast for a while and wound up in a warehouse way out in Long Island. And uh, through the good graces of Paul Beck up in up in Boston, uh, he got a truck and went out and uh, picked these things up and uh, brought them back here. And uh, uh, one of them fell off the truck in my in my loading dock, which is this one. <laughs> and that must have made a big dent in the country. <laughs> <laughs> Paul, um, Paul, Paul's used to driving around in big trucks. He just has a knack for that. Um, well, but, we, um, we had uh, five AVR2s that had been in a fire in Grand Rapids uh, at a Bible uh, place. And we kept two and sold three that paid for everything. Had, we had to replace basically everything on the transport. Um, the biggest problem was the, some of the ICs would were damaged by heat. It took a bit. Um, biggest problem I had with the AVR twos was the time based corrector would vary because it did a four bit and then another four bit, which was weird. Uh, rather than do it straight, and the easiest way I found to get that thing to work nice: stick a ramp in, blow it up as high as you could. And get all the steps out of the ramp by adjusting the two uh, pots on yep. on the A and B cards, and it it would make beautiful pictures after that. Yeah, somebody told me that. Well, you know that the digital time based corrector stuff started with their helical scan group in uh, Elk Grove Village. It didn't didn't come out of Redwood City, and uh, they built this thing called a, a TBC eight hundred. Was it eight hundred? CVS. The Bible score was. It was like six bed or something like that. This was a big bathtub shaped thing, and you put the VPR seventy nine hundred on top of it. Oh yeah, and you remember that? And and the um, 
uh, the, the, the 7900 was the first one inch machine with H lock. Uh, so if everything was right and, and, you know, it was the right phase of the moon, uh, that machine after eight or nine seconds would actually H lock. And then the TBC would work because it didn't have that big of a window. Uh, and I understand that some of that technology uh, came out of the AVR1 project, um, I think. The, the, um, the uh, VPR, VPR 7900, and I got the price on that sucker here right in front of me. Yeah, there's one. I just went past one over here in the shop, uh, which actually is in pretty good shape. Came out of Bell Labs. Uh, I installed it for them in, I guess, 19, I don't know, 78, something like that, maybe 74. And uh, uh, they yeah, were, you're you were talking 34,000 list. Yeah. And, and so, and you can buy a 1200 for uh, uh, 70,000 in. The first time I saw the 7900 was a time base corrected. They took an Amtech and a color tech and made it work. Yeah. Well, the, the only thing about those machines was that the broadcast engineers that I knew uh, were used to dealing with these big iron machines. And when they got that 7900 in or 7800 before it, um, the dog, it, it just they couldn't deal with it because it needed interchange adjustments all the time because it was a very large drum. It recorded a complete field on one pass of the head. And uh, the entrance and exit guides were very critical. I mean, you breathe on them and they would throw the machine out of interchange. Um, and then mm -hmm. trying to get tapes to play back from mm -hmm. another machine was a nightmare, which was it's been a chronic problem of one inch machines since day one. In fact, uh, some of the early machines, uh, uh, had uh, caveats in their in their uh, sales literature that said uh, at this time we cannot guarantee that tapes made on any machine will play back on any other. I remember reading that in the '60s and going, "Gee, this is not a good thing." And then uh, in New York here, we had a guy uh, at J.C. Penney who decided to put in a whole network of Sony CV machines, the half inch, <laughs> and, and uh, it cost him his job because, of course. They couldn't. They couldn't. They wouldn't play the tapes that came out of New York. Well, the the uh, seven thousand, all that series was uh, the, was made originally in the Elk Grove Village, and uh, yep, and yep. it was a totally different engineering team. And yep. the guys out in Redwood City didn't weren't consulted. I guess or no, it's it's very obvious when you look at those machines. I I've got. I got a 7,000, a 7,500, 7,800. I got a couple of 7,950s that I love to get out of a trailer too. But I got, like I said, I got to talk to Dave about maybe doing a one inch seminar because uh, that's a, also a very interesting uh, uh, bit of experience is how those machines came. I've got a 1961 Norelco machine here, which is all vacuum tube, and it works pretty good. In fact, Andy Warhol used it for his home movies. Uh, the only problem with it is, again, like anything else in that era, uh, there's no interchange. So we had uh, some Andy Warhol people show up uh, a few years ago, and, and I tried to try to adjust the uh, the, the drum and the inter the uh, exit and entrance guides so I could play the tape, and I couldn't get it. I spent I probably spent a week working on that, and of course they wouldn't leave the tapes. So um, uh, you know that was the end of that project. Well, interesting. The uh, IVC came out about that time, and we evaluated. <clears throat> and uh, the Ampex machine, I love the signal system on that, and I love the uh, transport on the IVC. And if we could have <laughs> married the two together, it would probably yeah. would have nice. Yep. Yep. I'm sorry, I'm just we're having just private conversation. Everybody's listening to. <laughs> yeah. Any other any questions about these squad machines? Uh, yeah. The, <laughs> hi, the, Wayne. Hi. Uh, do you know what machines RCA used at the World's Fair? Because they had this ten second delay by recording on one machine and uh, 150. Inches of tape. Oh, you know, later, uh, playback. A, a lot of people did that. I did it at WOR uh, with a pair of VR two thousands, 
I think they were about eight feet apart. And we put some rollers in the middle. And uh, the nice thing was that, you know, those quad machines don't really have a big problem with back tension. So we could uh, have one VR2000 recording video and another one playing it back. And we did that for, what was that? It was a, it wasn't the Allen, it wasn't Howard Stern. It was the guy before him, uh, uh, Morton Downey Jr. Had a TV show on the air and he was known for being a little rough sometimes. So uh, the uh, standards and practices people at WR insisted that we delay it it de delay his video before it went on the air. So that was done with a pair of VR two thousands. Yeah, I we had a, a, a pair of twelve hundreds with a bunch of roller arms in between. <laughs> yeah. yeah, same thing. Yeah, homemade. Yep. Nowadays. Nothing's on time. It's all delayed anyway. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And we throw in streaming and it's 30 seconds delayed. Audio and video separately. <laughs> yeah. Uh, George, anything that you uh, glossed over quickly that you might want to go back and uh, touch on? Um, no, not too much. Um on that velocity correct, they did sell a very expensive option on all the machines to correct that velocity error. Uh, it was about at least ten thousand dollars on an Ampex machine. And all, when they got to those digital machines, they all like the the TBC eight hundred you're mentioning, John, and all those. They also have digital velocity error correctors in them uh, to correct for that. Uh, you really can't tune it out with the uh, guide. It was something that was inherent. So having a VEC on a machine, that RCA made a module called this KVEC, which was Chroma Amplitude and Velocity Error Corrector. It was built by some other division of RCA, but I'll tell you what, it worked chant like a champ. One other thing I might add on those time-based correctors, you mentioned John for the TBC and Chris for the uh, AVR2. It's, I think, um, Tom Sprague's got the backstory on it, but they had two teams working on that. They had one team working on a switch delay line time-based corrector, kind of like what's in the AVR-1, and they had another team working on a digital time-based corrector, which is wound up in the AVR-2. And um, John, or, I'm sorry, Tom's got one of the analog ones uh, hooked up to, of all things, a TR-22 up there at MBT. <laughs> And so it will take the output of the machine and time base corrected and do all that stuff. But it was, it's, it's, I guess it's a prototype or something. And I don't know where he got it, but it's a, an analog version of the box. And it looks like the box that goes below a, a T VPR two uh, for the time base corrector, but it's an analog switch delay line box rather than oh. a digital box. Kind of like the ABR one kind of. Yeah, apparently they had they had that idea and they made a smaller one, but then the other team was working on the digital TBC and they packaged that and, it, and there was a machine called a TBC 800 and there was another one I think called a TBC 1 and I don't know the differences in them, but at one time uh, Marilyn... Just the, the A to D and D to A's were different, George. I remember that. I've, I've got a couple okay. of each of those. And then I think in the TBC 2... They, they, you know, uh, TRW had come out with that big chip and that replaced, yeah. replaced two boards in the uh, TBC. They pulled two boards out of it and replaced it with that one chip. That, that makes sense. I put one of those TBCs, digital <laughs> TBCs, into an Allen, and that replaced the uh, Amtec, ColorTech, ProCamp, Dropout Compensator, everything. Yeah. everything. And it made really – it looked like a VPR2 then. I mean, it was uh, – it really made nice pictures out of it. And then uh, you just had to uh, pick up the RF for the Dropout Compensator in it. In yeah. Interestingly – Ampex came out with a velocity air compensator, Velcom, the eleven thousand dollar price as you mentioned, and then RCA came out with the same thing, and they figured out, hey, I got the same thing we're addressing. Let's do the chroma as part of the same package, and that's that's why it's called KVAC. Uh, right. And they came out second with that. The uh, I talked to one conversation I had with Charlie Anderson. I said I always like the look of the analog. TBCs, there's, you don't see the digitizing. He says it's a cost thing. And you got so much better range, et cetera. And so that's why they dropped. That was one of the things that the reasons why they dropped the uh, uh, analog and went totally digital. 
It was interesting in the TR600 that John showed you a while ago from RCA, their last quad. They tried to build a digital TVC for that machine, and apparently it didn't work well. So they took it out and went back to uh, analog time-based correction, just like uh, the earlier uh, RCA machines, which was fine. Yeah. Yeah, George, I heard that a, a bunch of Drexel grad students designed that 600 electronics. I don't know. They worked. Well, <laughs> that well, was a Drexel grad. I have a question. <laughs> Hi, George. Uh, Hi. Hi. The question I had that you haven't mentioned, what was the rating of the number of tape passes that you could get out of a tape? Oh, I I don't think there was a big problem with that. I, you know, I mean, if, if, you know, you could probably get fifty to one hundred passes on it. Uh, more. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. Chris, you probably know. I, I don't. Uh, I know on the on the ACR twenty fives, we'd be playing the same commercial and promos all day long, and yeah. you keep recycling those, and they'd be at hundreds of passes. Um, yeah. I was doing primarily editing and. Uh, so it was all computer, and you'd be making all sorts of passes. I never had a problem with the with uh, it wearing out. Now there were some issues with some tapes that the binder wasn't done well, and you get shedding, and we threw that back to the manufacturer real quick. It depends on the tape brand, and it depends on how you know how they're treated and where they're stored and things like that i would say you could probably on a good tape maybe get a couple hundred passes anyway or something like that but you know uh mbt's got a whole lot of uh low band color uh tapes uh of the joan rivers show from the 1960s and the story i heard on that was that joan rivers used to joke about her husband being tight and they he really was he would they told me he would go out to the dumpster at nbc and pull tapes that they had thrown away in the dumpster and take it back in and say here's what you're going to record the show on for syndication and uh you know tape reels were pretty expensive in those days but if you had if you didn't have a dropout compensator i'll tell you what uh you would get a snowstorm on some of these tapes you put up so once they came out with dropout compensators you could probably live with the tapes running longer and and everybody had docs you know into the 70s but earlier than that in the 60s not everybody had a doc so uh it didn't look good if the tape was worn out well that's what i was wondering because the uh, distortion of the tape when the head goes through it you know what it, it's amazing that after uh like you know, like Chris said on the ACRs and the A- and the TCR, uh, those carts got used all the time, over and over and over. And uh, unless you damaged one, pretty much you never had to, to touch them. And those things were, you know, we got thirty seconds to a one minute or spot on those carts, and you know you could play those things a hundred times in a week, maybe more. Uh, never had a problem. And and I was just going to say what George mentioned earlier about you know the head tips penetrating into the tape. At fourteen, at fifteen, or fourteen thousand RPM, you would think it would wreck the tape, but I guess you got to really hand it to 3M. They really figured out how to do that. I mean, it was quite, a, you know, the chemistry of videotape is uh, is half of this. It's, you know, these electronics uh, developments are wonderful, but if it wasn't for those guys in Minneapolis that figured out how to make that tape, and if you'll notice on the shoe at the top, uh, the there is a little bit where the curves and then it has a slight curve up to vertical and that's where the head enters so it isn't hitting the edge of the tape it actually goes in and because the audio track is at the top you you don't it doesn't matter if you are intimate contact immediately on the head you got a, a couple mils to get down to where the actual tracks are yeah it's it's just amazing technology. Yeah, I, I I don't know anything about the chemistry of making that tape, but boy, it just seemed to get better and better. But every once in a while, you get a stinker. Uh, I had to record Governor Rockefeller once in the in the uh, Waldorf Astoria back years ago, and I had to do it on on one inch machine. So I had a I had a Sony EV, I had an IVC eight eight twenty, and I had. Uh, an Ampex 7500. And I figured, okay, 
I, I can't go wrong. I'm, I'm sure I'm going to get this thing because he was going to talk for an hour. So I had this all set up, all this tape racked up. Well, the Ampex clogged in 15 minutes. The Sony clogged in 20. And the IBC clogged about 25. So I didn't, I blew that whole recording. And I forget who it was for, but it was somebody big deal. And uh, uh, the only thing that was common about that whole episode was the tape was Memorex Chroma 80. And to this day, when I see a roll of that stuff, my attitude is throw it in the garbage because I never saw a roll of that stuff that ever worked. And I mean, maybe the two inch was better, but boy, that one inch stuff was horrible. They, they had their issues with two inch as well. Did they? Yeah. Yeah. The inter- interesting, we once had a guy that recorded this major speech by CEO of the automo- of an automotive company. And he did it as insert edit on a blank. <laughs> no control track. Oh, we, we salvaged that. <laughs> but it took us all night to figure out how to do it, make up some red board stuff. Interestingly, the tape stocks were different. Fuji had a very stiff back. 3M didn't have a stiff of back. And then you had the problem that the different ways the pinch rollers are set up on the machines. If you look at a ABR2, a 1200 or whatever, 1000, it comes in and there is a uh, there is a thing at the top and bottom and it holds the pinch roll. It has to come in perfectly parallel to the capstan. If it comes in where it hits the top or the bottom first, it skews the tape and it gets damaged by the next guy down, uh, which is the audio stacks. RCA has the other problem. There's a self-centering one, and it also does strange things to it. So you had to be real careful. We had a lot of tape damage on syndicated shows that we would were sending out, and we didn't like that. <laughs> yeah. Well, I don't, I don't I mean, know how, it's, uh, these don't know life, food, Sorry, go ahead, Wayne. Yeah, these uh, lifetime figures for the heads and the tape is what interested me about the World's Fair because they were running that See Yourself demo all day long for six months. And so I was wondering how often they had to re- replace heads well, you know, those that was 64, 65. Um, I don't know if they had those AlphaCon 2 heads at that point. I'm not sure if they did. But uh, the later RCA heads lasted a long time. I mean, I've got some, I got some of those TR60s I have. I have four of them here. And I haven't touched the heads. I mean, since I've had them, they, they just run and run and run. Um, and, and physics did the first thousand hour guarantee, I think, didn't they? Yeah, I think maybe you're right. Yeah, but it, you know, we were getting six hundred to a thousand hours on uh, Mark tens and Mark fifteens. Uh, if we got if we were down at the bottom, we were thinking we we've got something wrong. But we also had no smoking allowed in the area. Uh, clean room, uh, you know, tried to keep it clean, and uh, the machines were kept clean, but. Um, it was anything less than 600. It was like, oh, we got a problem. Yeah. And and at that time, I think it was 1200 bucks to refurbish, so two bucks an hour. Well, it's very expensive now. Uh, well, with, 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 with uh, Tony Corte shutting down his operation in Colorado Springs, there's only one guy left, I think, out in California who's doing that. And uh, I don't know what he's charging, but... Uh, uh, I bet he took advantage of the fact that he's. Uh, oh, let's see. Did your girl's got a message up here? A head tech. How much? Seven thousand dollars for a rebuild? <laughs> wow. Wow. Tony used to charge me fifteen hundred dollars for the Mark Fifteens. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it's it's gone up, and you could buy a brand new head for like thirty seven fifty for uh, when you bought the machine. And it was just keep trading them in. 
Mm-hmm. Yeah. Those burnout machines. I sent one. I sent one to uh, Ampex, and the uh, and I sent one to uh, the guys out in Video Magnetics or whatever. Somebody out in California, and uh, Ampex comes back. We aren't going to do anything with. Well, oh, uh, send it back to me. I'll. Uh, I got somebody that will do it. Well, we took it all apart. They sent me. <laughs> they sent me a Mark Fifteen. Yeah. Yeah. Great machines. Yeah, it's a lot of fun. It's it's all well, over now. <laughs> when, when you think they lasted twenty years in manufacture, and and then you look at some of the other machines, all those digital machines like D one, D two, D three, D five, they didn't last that long. Well, I, I've got a pile of D five HD machines. And other than some capacitor issues, they've been very, very reliable. I've not had any trouble with them at all. Um, and I've had them manufacturing. I've had them for twenty years, and uh, uh, I've got thirty-seven hundreds now. But the original machine, the two thousand and the twenty-seven hundred, the only thing that goes wrong with those things is uh, a little electrolytics. Uh, they tend to short out or open, or they just they just go bad. I don't understand why Panasonic never learned anything about that because the machine is in, inherently make, is a great format. Um, not good. I mean, I've got Sony machines that are from 1963 that never had a capacitor changed. I don't know. Same thing with these quads. I mean, I, I don't think, I, George, I don't think I've ever replaced a, a cap in an RCA power supply, but I have replaced them in the in the video output uh, modules. Those things have gone bad. But uh, when you did that machine up in Boston for uh, up in Rhode Island, did you have a lot of capacitor issues with that uh, TRT? Oh, with the TRT? Uh, with the TRT-1, we started out by replacing every electrolytic can in the machine. Uh, <laughs> it was about $3,000 worth of cans from uh, Hayseed Hamfax. We just didn't want to mess with them because they were bad. But we didn't touch. And, and then on the uh, WP-16 power supplies, we replaced all the uh, big electrolytics in those w- WP-16s. And I rebuilt the 150 minus 150 supply and replace those caps. But any big electrolytics we changed um, because we've literally had them explode in the machines. Um, And uh, in fact, we had one uh, just recently, uh, Jay turned the machine on to demo to somebody and the, and the 24 volts supply, you know, those uh, uh, for the relays didn't come up and we thought, what could go, what could have possibly gone wrong with that? Well, that's thing's got a constant voltage transformer in it with a resonating cap on it. And the resonating cap had shorted oh. uh, on the transformer. It's a, you know, a big oil filled cap. So we put yeah. a motor capacitor in there and bang, it comes right up. But, we we did not touch any of the other capacitors in the machine, all the uh, uh, regular um, values that were not electrolytics we left alone. And when I went through the machine, I only found one of those caps. There was a, a 0.1, 600 volt or something like that sprig in the uh, one of the servos that was dead shorted. And uh, that was the only one I found. All the rest of them we left alone and they're fine. Um, the uh, But the electrolytics... Uh, yeah, they're bad, and rather than keep troubleshooting weird problems, uh, we just swapped them out. Yeah. The only capacitor problems I had with this AVR1 were in the um, um, in the sub-base for the head. Um, there's a bunch of tantalums in there, and uh, plus and minus 12-volt buses, and they were all shorted, every one of them. I, I haven't uh, in in the later machines, you know, like I did the TR4 high band and uh, uh, those and the uh, the electrolytics, those little Mallory silver ca- caps that the RCA machines are just full of. I've maybe found one or I think I had one of them short in one of the TR70s, but most of those are holding up just fine. And uh, that's really good for them. Yeah. I think on a couple of the AVR2 boards, we had some capacitors go bad on the main incoming power line to each of the boards. 
I think Tom changed a slew of caps in the AVR2 at MBT. Uh, I don't know what the, the story on. Board, the audio board tantalum short. And when they short, they burn up. There's a series resistor, a small one, two ohms, five ohms, something like that, off the machine bus. And when those capacitors short, that resistor explodes. And usually it sets the board on fire. Um, no, I had that happen over at ABC. And we, we wound up having to actually find another board because it, it just it just charred it, couldn't fix it. So, you know, you just got to be aware. Watch for smoke all the time. The odor resistance. Yep. <laughs> you're bringing back you're bringing back memories. <laughs> so, yeah, sorry about that. Hey, Chris, uh, are, you, are you the guy with the RA four thousand drawings or books? Yes. I got to talk to you about that because I have an RA4000. <laughs> you have one? Yes, I do. And you got AVR1s? Yes, I do, right behind me. <laughs> How many uh, AVR1s? Oh, I just have one of them. But the uh, but the 4000, I think, will work with AVR3s. Um, could be. I don't know. Uh, AVR2s, there was a, a, a thing that went on the back of it so that you could uh, uh, interrupt the cables between the transport and the uh, electronics to take over control. I've got a, I've got the complete four thousand manual. Yeah, yeah, this this one I have came from Belo, came from uh, uh, originally WFAA in Dallas. Uh, oh, Frank Davis. He was the, he's uh, the one that uh, uh, I had problems with it. Because the AVR twos are so damn fast on lockup that the RA four thousand looks for a coincidence between the time code and the time code counter is counting down. Uh, we use ten second rolls because uh, I think it was because of the of the uh, you needed to get a little bit better. You use three seconds on a one, um, and boost was still on. And guess what oh. would happen? It would slip. Couldn't get metric. Yeah. And it was ah oh, no, no no it's it's in the machine is no and and uh, so he, about three in the morning we figured it out and he goes oh sometimes you have somebody grab you by your ears and pull your head out of your no what yeah I just want to see if I can fire it up and make it do something I have no idea if it works um, easy to easy to fire up um, is it a, is it all in one in the console. Yeah, we had a five machine one, and I'll tell you, we we were the only house that could do five machine edits, and, and uh, we had a yeah. situation. But uh, I, I don't want to. I don't want to revisit editing. I I had three TR seventies at an ad agency in New York that we we made work with a Datatron Tempo, and Ooh. that was a nightmare. You got my uh, sympathy. <laughs> oh, it was it was the just the the voltage interfaces to the RCA were difficult because of that seventy volt business, and um, the Datatron at the time didn't and they had never done one before, and they built me these interface boards and uh, yeah, they didn't work and uh, finally I got I guess it was Tom Belford who was their tech at the time, came up here and we worked on it, it took about two weeks before we figured out how to make it work we built all kinds of voltage translators and all kinds of stuff to to make it talk to the machines. But it did, it worked for a while, worked pretty good. Okay, so let me ask a question here. Um, the AVR3s, what do they have on the back for connectors? Do they have one that's like a, a, a different remote than the remote? I'd have to go back and look. I got, I got again. I got two of those. The one I showed you out in the lobby, and then there's one back here. Um, I don't know. I have to, you know, I've never controlled them. No. Okay. Uh, well, uh, it's just I asking the question because uh, the cable was a big uh, multi-pin that went off to the uh, interface box, and then it would, would translate from that. Also. You can make the thing do color frame, even though it's not built in, because it, it was designed for both PAL and NTSC. Take horizontal drive, divide by two, feed it into the 7.8 kilohertz, uh, stick it on the back of it, and away you go. And then you've got uh, the ability to 
uh, also do previews with a switcher in, inside the uh, inside the um, RE4000. So you're looking for a book. Yep. Okay. Uh, let's let's talk a little bit about how we could, how we can do this. Because I got the book. What am I going to do with it? I may have a 4000 interface manual too. Um, and so we can see what we can do there for you. Okay. Yeah. You know, my my email C Hill three one five at AOL. Okay. Uh, uh. George got my uh, squeeze room book. But that was a piece of junk. Anybody got one? Uh, uh, squeeze room. If they do, shoot them. <laughs> They're out of their misery. And where are you located in New Jersey, John? I'm in Morris County. I'm between Morristown and Booton. Uh, Route 80 goes right through here. What? Route 80. I-80? Yep, I can go from here to San Francisco. <laughs> Why do you want to go to San Francisco these days? It's gone down the tubes. <laughs> if I wanted to, well, you don't want to be here this week. It's it's ninety degrees outside still. I don't have air conditioning where I live. Oh well, do you need it? Uh, only on a couple of days a year. Oh, well, we've had I a. Live in, couple... I live in the Detroit area. Oh, that's yes. It's it's been pretty hot here on the East Coast. Yeah. So anyway, we can talk offline, uh, do this offline and figures out what to do because it may not be worth it if you don't have the right cables or can't make them up. Well, uh, I can make I can make cables. It just uh, I want to make sure whatever, whatever boards or parts need to be in the RA that they're there. I don't know. As long as, as, long as all the cards are in there, you should be able, in good shape. There's two frames. Uh, the bottom one has three sets of cards for the three machines, and top one is all the logic and all the other stuff. Um, and the only other problem you'll find you have is the uh, people pound the switches through the panel. It was it was the fastest editor that I ever watched go, and faster than a CMX. We did thirty second spots. I could crank wow. them out. Yeah. I, I cranked out 15, 20 of them in an hour. Wow. Well, five machines, one machine's record. Just keep loading, guys. <laughs> there, we're doing uh, cores and inserts. Before the client walks in, you lay down all the bars and uh, tone for minute spots. Just one minute, one minute, one minute, add. But there, you have to know how to do it to make it work so that you. Because your durations, you can then to do match frames. It's a little tough if you don't do it the right way. Okay. I'm All right, Dave. Uh, let's see. I haven't got anything else at this point. Oh, I'll, I'll see if I can find the. You're close to New York City, then. Yes, I'm about 25 miles west of New York. Uh, I never liked going there. This my <laughs> okay. I see. I'm looking at my map. Yeah, take the train. Take an Amtrak train. Uh, anyway. All righty, we'll see what we can do for you on that. And I'll see what I've got. The, it shouldn't be too much of a problem, but I don't know if it can interface or not. You'll have to figure out. I know it was direct plug into the AVR1 on the back. Oh, Charlene is on. IBM, where the heck are you? 
Look at this. You got two AVR ones in one place at one time. Amazing. Uh, quick question. Go ahead. I had a quick question. I wonder if uh, I I joined late, and I wonder if I saw John in his collection see a VR one thousand Ampex. Yeah. Yeah, I, I showed one of them earlier. Um, I'm not sure. I can, if you want me, I can roll over there again and take a look. You want to see it? Uh, no, don't. I've got. Don't I've got bother my, that. But uh, I got stuff set up. My on a boss cart. was Ray Dolby for 35 years, and so it was interesting to see that. This is, yeah, it's a 1000 C, the model that I have. We'll have That's the recording. Uh, the, the, the recording will be on the early television uh, YouTube channel. So you can go back and catch it uh, uh, there or, you know, as many times as you want. <laughs> okay. I'll go back and uh, check. Uh, my boss was Ray Dolby for 35 years. So it was oh, really interesting wow. to know that you have a uh, VR 1000. Yeah. There's a couple of them around. The one at MBT in Rhode Island is uh, functional. It's a color machine with uh, intersync, and it's a VR1000C. Oh, the, the, the B, the B1? B, was it a B? Okay. Yeah. But anyway, it's yeah. color. It's got the uh, yeah. Amtech and color tech on yeah, it and the intersync. That's a long story with that machine. Tom, we were bidding together on an auction in New York, and Tom was interested in a Dumont scanner, and that thing showed up on the auction. And I said, eh, okay. Well, behind it and part of the same auction were two racks of VR1000B electronics. So that's how Tom got that. <laughs> Let me go grab my 4000 book and I'll be right back. Okay? I'll sure. see what I got for you. Then we can, then we can call quits. Okay. Why won't that head go back? What can I do here? You know, one thing we didn't talk about in terms of maintenance on these guys was uh, what you need to have to work on these machines. Um, every one of these machines came with a library of manuals. Uh, the AVR ones, there's at least five or six books, uh, pretty big, thick three ring binders. And then there's a whole bunch of supplemental material on the uh, options and on the FEBs, the field, uh, field engineering bulletins. Uh, plus, you need to have all the extender boards. And <clears throat> this machine, the AVR1, uh, there's got to be about eight extenders, and every one's different. Let me see if I've got one up here. Yeah. Oh. This is one of them. And the... Uh, the connector is offset on the end, and this is only good for uh, one small area of the machine. There's a whole pile of these things. Mm -hmm. uh, if you, you know, any collector that wants to get into this business uh, uh, needs to make sure that he's got all the pieces. Uh, otherwise, he's he's got a he's got a a, a ghost machine. He's never going to get anywhere. It's very important. And then, of course, the other thing that's nice is uh, if you've been to school on this or you know somebody who has or you know a retired television station engineer, uh, these machines take quite a while uh, to, to get used to and really get, dig into them. Because if you, don't, if you don't do things in the right order, you're likely to get, get yourself uh, really bollocked up and you'll cause more damage than you will fix. So um, 
you know, there's a certain sequence doing things on these machines, and you you have to know what that is. And some of the stuff is uh, it's not intuitive, and uh, it's something that you you only learn if you go to the manufacturer's class. And the last time I checked, Ampex was no longer running service classes on VTRs. Oh, too bad. Okay, well, I've got the book here. By the way, this uh, it's got 2,200 bits and for the interfaces. I do have an interface for 1,200. The uh, gets, uh, schematics are 80-some-odd uh, pages. <laughs> And the LMs are 145, 150, and yeah, it's but it's it's not it's not hard. There's a power supply up in the top, and then the down below the it's it's pretty straightforward. I, I'm just amazed that there's no computer in it. It's all hardwire logic. So somebody had to do one hell of a, a job of figuring all that out to make it work. Wow. Just, you know what I'm saying? Um, now, the other the other thing is, this is, the book is for the 80-bit thing. There was a earlier version that, I don't know if they ever sold it or not, that was before time code was uh, set up as 80 bits. And so that's why it's called the 80 bit version. Yeah. Yeah. Also known as Simpty. Yep. Which, but uh, the the only thing you did with a 1200 was you had to put a uh, preamp behind the audio stack so you could get the um, wide wide band in yeah in shuttle yeah. Yep, and then you then you had a um, bunch of cables that you stuck in between the control panel to the other thing. So there were different real harness things that were just extenders. Had a plug and a socket on it, and the uh, so you put those in place. It was pretty straightforward. Yeah, the the ABR threes have a wide band output off the Q channel, and uh, they reproduce time code just great in shuttle, no problem. Okay, I'm seeing the RA four thousand. It's a looks like it just has a bunch of uh, commands that go into it, and then another one's for the editor. And you know, it's pretty straightforward. Yeah, I just want to light the thing up and see if I can work. <laughs> well, if uh, all I would say to you is uh, just plug it in and turn it on. If it does, there's no machines on it, it doesn't care. It will just light up if it's in case. And uh, but by the way, that uh, sucker was um, expensive at one point. And uh, let's see, if I, I got the price with this year. It was, I have no idea. It was RA4000. Uh, oh, basic was 21K. Uh, oh, it was 30,000 for three. And we did a five thing, so we added another forty one nine. Wow. And then you had to add the interface for two twelve uh, for the twelve hundreds. Um and with the AVR ones you just needed a, a cable. So it wasn't it was pretty safe. Any, anyway, I'm done. Unless somebody's got something else. It's getting close to bedtime. What else can we do to ruin your day? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, we shoot up another Saturday. <laughs> um, hey, it is what it is. I, I can't be out on the lake. So, yeah. All righty. I think I'm done. Anybody? George, have you got anything to say before? You're always good or something. Oh, great. Uh, thanks for everybody. Thanks to everybody. And uh, thanks, John, for doing the great demo. Oh, did, did I mention that it was Keith Reynolds who was the modular products guy to you? 
Where do I know that name from? Was he yeah, I know Keith Reynolds, uh-huh. From yeah. Grass Valley, uh-huh. Grass, yeah. And he was with IBC before that. Yep, that's where I knew him. You know, I used to work at Grass Valley, as did George. And that's gone. <laughs> it's a shadow of itself. I understand there's nothing left out in uh, California for it. All righty. I think I'm going to call quits. Leave you guys. Have fun. It's always good to see George. And a very good, interesting uh, discussion about two-inch tape, which I loved. Well, I'll have to get my PV120 out and go over that <laughs> thing. The only problem is I don't have any tapes for it. I think that that's the main reason I never investigated it more thoroughly. Yeah, you're not going to find any either. <laughs> Boy. <laughs> hmm. Do you have any? I have one tape. Oh. And I don't know I don't know what's on it because it's a 120 tape and I have a 100. Well, I'll have to drag it out then and see what I what I've got there. But anyway, well, was it first. a helical was it a helical scan or was it a yeah. straight Oh no, it was, it was helical. And the machine's got, I think, about eight vacuum tubes in it, which is another interesting thing. The, oh. the motor, yeah, the motor drive amplifier are tetrodes, and there's some D sixty J eights in there for preamps. There's all kinds of cool stuff in that machine. Hmm. Uh, do you have any uh, manuals on it or anything? Oh, I got all the books. Oh, that's why I just want, the, you know, like I said, you're the first guy in fifty years that I, I've ever talked to who had one of these things. Hmm. Uh, you're not breaking any new ground here. I've got a lot of things that people haven't seen in 50 years. <laughs> but anyway, I'll drag that thing out. And if you've got something more interesting, you know, uh, something, maybe we can do some trading there. Yep. Let me know what six. you're looking for. Yeah. Okay. Well, thank you so much. It's very interesting. I finally found somebody that really, you know, they can explain some things to me there. I used to fix those things. Uh, but, you know, I'll tell you, it's a long time ago now. Hmm. I've got two uh, Ampex, two quad machines. I think they're the 1200s, maybe. They're, yeah, that was pretty common. Uh, I've got uh, I've got two of those. One's uh, both record and playback. The other one's just playback only but I might be interested in trading one of those for something interesting. I don't need two of them. But yeah, anyway. I, have a, I have a pair of 2000s, but I don't have a 1200. I'm not sure I need it. Hmm. Well, find something there. But anyway, uh, what's-his-name wants me to do a thing on part of my collection here on this very channel here. and I've just got it scattered in four buildings, and it's difficult. So I'm going to have to do some videotaping here or something. Yeah, I've got two trailers out in the back here, and I got another one out in the front parking lot, and uh, they're, they're just full of quads. Oh, <laughs> so, and, and oh that's interesting. And cart machines. And I thought I had a lot of stuff. It no, took me it, four it, buildings to do all of we this. Had, and... We had nine trailers full of stuff, and uh, one of my sons who works for me here made me throw a lot of it out. So, um, oh, hmm. we're thinned out, but I'm not as thin as I should be. Uh, I'm, where I'm are you? Pardon me? Where are you located? I'm on, I'm right off Route 80 and 287 in northern New Jersey. Hmm. I used to live up in New Jersey up there. I was at Fort Monmouth, New Jersey. Oh, that's and south the, of me. It's quite a way south. Yeah. And I used to, I was a radar instructor up there. Oh, okay. So anyway, I know New Jersey pretty well up there, and I yeah, miss those it. days. It's on the south side of the bridge. Yeah. I used to hang out there in Seabright and Asbury Park and all of that, and I miss those days. Anyway, thank you so much. That was an interesting chat that you did. All right. On that note, maybe we'll roll up the sidewalks here. But uh, thank you to both of you. This was absolutely fabulous.